This video is designed to help you relax or fall asleep. If you keep coming back to these videos but you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe now. YouTube stops promoting my videos if people don't interact. Before we begin, if you're planning to drift off while watching this video, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the comments or simply say hello. Your comments truly make a difference. Also, if you haven't already, liking the video and subscribing means a lot. It's incredible to see people tuning in from all over the world. Thank you once more. Get cozy, turn off the lights, get yourself a glass of water and make sure you lock the door. Remember to drop a hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. I had blocked this story from my memory until my girlfriend reminded me of it a couple days ago. I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year and I used multiple dating apps before we started dating. I had my Snapchat listed in many of my dating app profiles. This is important. Nothing led to anything with the apps, I talked to people for a bit and eventually the conversation would die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never deleted my account, meaning people could still see my profile and my Snapchat account. I realized this after a few people would add me, but it didn't bother me much because I'd tell them I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, the conversation would end at that point. But there was this one guy that added me, let's call him Adam. And he asked me if I was available. Being straight, I was used to guys adding me, so I gave him the usual response. Sorry, I'm straight and I have a girlfriend. I expected him to leave me alone, but it didn't stop him. At first the messages were normal, how was your day, what did you do today? Simple stuff like that. Being the nice guy I am, I responded because I thought this guy just wanted to be friends and having a gay friend is okay with me. Then the messages progressively got more creepy, he started asking questions about my girlfriend and not the basic questions. As the days passed, I started to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure about it, so I didn't make any assumptions that it was him. I shared Tyler's Snapchat with my girlfriend, who added him to investigate. As soon as she added Tyler's Snap, Tyler flipped out on her, confirming that it was indeed Adam. Realizing this, I blocked him again. After that, everything went quiet from Adam for about a month. I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. We often see each other, and our families are good friends. Anyway, a month went by until I received a letter with no address or name on it, just my name on the front. I opened it, and to my shock and horror, it was basically a love letter from Adam. The letter expressed his love for me and his desire for me to run off with him. The letter took a very sexual turn halfway through, with explicit descriptions of what he wanted to do to me. At that moment, I had two horrifying realizations. One was that he knew my address, and two, he had dropped off the letter himself, meaning he was in my town. I immediately called my girlfriend, who was equally shocked. After consulting with my parents, we called the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked and removed Adam's social media information and the letter had no return address, there was nothing we could do about it. Day after day, letters kept appearing in my mailbox until they also started showing up at my girlfriend's place. Her letters were far worse than mine. Adam wrote about how much he hated her and how he wanted to hurt her. He described in detail the ways he would inflict pain on her until she broke up with me. Like me, she reported this to the police, but they could do nothing about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for vacation and I was house-sitting for them. The first couple of days went fine until one of the last nights of the week. As usual, I was at their house, watching TV on the couch, when the power went out. It was around 1 a.m. and it was pitch black. The next few seconds were silent and then I heard a window smash from the office. To help you understand the layout of the house, when you entered the front door, the living room was on your left, straight ahead were both the kitchen and stairs, and to the right were the office and dining room. Upstairs, as soon as you reached the top of the stairs, there was a bathroom straight ahead. My girlfriend's room was on the right, and the other bedrooms were on the left. I immediately grabbed a kitchen knife and ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. 
I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into the closet. As soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the intruder pounding up the steps. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time and she stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready, just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes passed until I heard the intruder start walking toward my girlfriend's room. In the precious seconds I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. As soon as he opened the door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and drove it into his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain as I heard a heavy metallic object make a large thud as it hit the ground. From there, I bolted out of the house, where I was met by four squad cars and cops with their guns raised. I raised my hands, shouting that he was upstairs in the right room. A few minutes passed, and the intruder was dragged out, still screaming in pain. With the siren lights flooding the street, I got a glimpse of his face. It was Adam. Later, an officer informed me that the metallic thud was caused by him dropping his handgun. Adam was from Texas and had traveled up to my state to be with me. He had rented a room at a local motel and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailbox daily. He was doing this in the early hours of the morning. This was confirmed by the security footage from the motel he was staying at. On the night of the break-in, Adam had plans to kill my girlfriend and her family so that I would choose to be with him. He managed to pry open the power box, switched off the power to her house along with neighboring houses, and broke in with the intention of her being there. Well, unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how the outcome would have been different if they hadn't gone on vacation, and I am grateful that I still have my girlfriend as well as her family alive. So, to any stalkers out there, please stay away from my girlfriend. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a large, scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often used my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked and at this point he made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. I gripped my rifle, aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size, and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. He was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop and warned him what would happen but he just moaned at me like a zombie and shouted, shoot, do it. Then he lunged towards me. I took my third shot. I can't recall whether it was buckshot or a slug, but it left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. 
I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator, who had heard our entire exchange, which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop, or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into our rural area. This happened to me over a decade ago, but I will never forget the feeling deep in my chest. Both that night and the next morning when the true nature of the situation became apparent. It was late December in a small Texas town. we just received five inches of snow earlier in the morning. I can't remember what time it was, all I remember is it was dark outside, and I was playing in my room. It's important to note that my room was made up of two parts, a mudroom with a door leading out front, then my actual bedroom. The door was an older style wood door with all the old hardware, and had a window on the top half. It had a window shade, but that wouldn't stop anyone from looking in if they wanted. My room was the frontmost with my parents' room being in the back of the house. Suddenly, the knob was not being gently moved, someone was turning it with force. This door was one that had to be locked from the inside, so the knob could turn and open freely. Luckily, there were two deadbolts. Whoever was on the other side just figured out the knob was free to open. As soon as I heard it turn all the way, I sprung up to the wall about five feet from the door, my back to the wall. The door fell silent. I found myself glued to the wall, unable to move. Then, the knob turned slowly, I remember watching, waiting for it to turn all the way. When it did, whoever was on the other side started trying to budge the door and pry. At first, it was easy going, but then they started pounding into the door with their foot. They got only two kicks in, when I unfroze and screamed for my life. I sprinted to the back of the house to get my parents. They asked what was wrong, and I said someone tried to break in. They ran over and checked, not bothering to look outside, which I pleaded them to. They just said my imagination was running wild and it was an animal or the old age of the house. They took one final look in my mudroom, not bothering to investigate any further. I was told to go to bed. It took me hours. I don't even remember falling asleep. All I remember is staring at the door from my bed, never taking my eyes off the doorknob. Suddenly, I was woken up by my parents, who were obviously distressed and seemed to be scared. My mom grabbed me by both shoulders and got right in front of me. She asked very sternly why I thought someone tried to break in. When I told them this time, they seemed to listen. I was worried how serious they were as they asked me about everything. When I was done, they said they had to show me something. They took me to the front door and out to the front yard, pointing to my door near the driveway. You could clearly see the boot prints in the snow, walking along the street through our yard and straight to my window, then my mudroom door, where I had been playing the night before. The police showed up and took a report, but nothing ever came of it. I was never able to sleep well in that house. I can never forget what it felt like as a child to go through this and not have my parents believe me. I'm just glad I was not home alone and very thankful for that strong door. Hello. I'm a 20-year-old French girl. To set the context, I live in a suburb in a small residence with six houses. My gate is often broken, and most of the time it's wide open, giving easy access to our small courtyard. My house has one floor with four bedrooms, including mine. Downstairs, there's a guest bedroom which we use as a treatment room due to my health issues. It's where we keep all the equipment and medicines. I also have a dog who means the world to me. He feels everything and even senses my epileptic seizures before they happen. He can even tell when the nurses are arriving by the sound of their tires in our yard. He never barks unless there's a problem. A nurse visits me four to five times a day for treatments, including infusions. This is an important part of my story. One morning, as usual, 
My nurse, Sandra, arrived at 8 a.m. She administered my treatment, and we chatted like we always did. After about 40 minutes, she left, saying she might be a little late next time, but I shouldn't be worried. That day, my parents were at work, and I had a medical appointment in the morning. I was home alone, except for the nurse's visits every four hours. When I returned from my appointment, I sat on the sofa with my dog while waiting for the next nurse. When I heard tire noises, I thought it was Sandra arriving a bit early. My dog started growling, which was unusual. I looked at the time, 11.50 a.m. I assumed Sandra might have switched with the previous patient, as she sometimes did. I heard a knock and I went to the door. I saw a young woman I had never met before. She introduced herself as Camille, a third year at nursing school, and explained that Sandra had sent her to prepare my treatment. I wasn't suspicious, I was used to students coming over. But I was a bit surprised because Sandra usually informed me in the morning or sent a message. Also, she never left a student alone on the first visit. I led Camille to the treatment room and showed her the way. While she washed her hands, my dog's behavior became strange. He growled as she approached me and circled me, so I decided to leave him in the living room and close the door to keep him calm. I didn't pay much attention to what Camille was doing, I was on my phone at that moment. Then, I noticed she was preparing a syringe rather than using the pre-made saline syringe as usual. I glanced up and saw that my treatment ampoules were untouched, but I had heard the distinct sound of ampoules breaking. Something felt off. As she approached me with the syringe, I received a message from Sandra saying she'd be there in five minutes and asked me to start setting up the equipment. I made up an excuse, telling Camille that I needed to use the restroom and left her in the treatment room. My dog kept barking and growling. When I reached the toilet downstairs, I sent Sandra a message telling her about the woman and she had no idea what I was talking about. I was terrified and started crying in the bathroom. Camille came to check on me and asked if everything was okay. I assured her it was, and that's when I heard the front door slam shut. Two minutes later, it reopened, and I heard Sandra's voice. I left the bathroom, still crying, and Sandra asked me what had happened. I explained the situation and showed her the treatment room. We called the police, who arrived, examined the evidence, and took samples from the syringe and other items prepared by Camille. The test results were shocking. The syringe contained a paralyzing substance, enough to paralyze a 120 kilograms man, and the IV contained a highly concentrated medicine that could have stopped anyone's heart. To this day, we don't know who Camille really was. Thankfully, I never heard from her again. She had stolen all my opioids but left my tablet and computer untouched. Looking back, I realized my dog had sensed Camille's ill intentions. I should have been more vigilant, especially since she was a stranger and on her own. My treatments are far from simple. I often wonder what could have happened if I hadn't checked my phone that day. Okay. Before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country South Africa for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences and alarms. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely around the garden as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in maid and a gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them, it's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our maid is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So this happened in 2007 when I was 9 years old. My older brother was 10 and we had just gotten our first cell phones that day, my dad surprised us after work. You may think we were quite young to have phones, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. 
We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter, who was 18, was like an older sister to us, and she was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember the maid's daughter making a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. That's why I noticed it as well. Sure, they bark, but it was usually the dachshunds that yapped when the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking non-stop. My dad appeared in our room and mentioned to us that he also noticed the dogs incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with him and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad said he had a terrible feeling because of this and because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called after them, they usually come running, but tonight they all seemed to just look at him. They then turned back around and continued going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch, sort of using it as an excuse for my brother not to come with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dogs seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched to the steps and just as he realized what was happening, it was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Four men in balaclavas stepped out of the darkness, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. He said that he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded by saying, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu, assuming my dad couldn't understand, because it's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently, because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, shit. The cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this guy, grab what we can, and leave. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge, and continued to say how he can't go back to jail again. And they need to get out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then took advantage of this guy's fear. My dad interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they're saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did the trick. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guys started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP, or else they'd be caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan was slowly turning to shit, as a third guy had put it. The aggressive guy pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart towards the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. The maid's daughter and I were obviously also oblivious to everything when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut and told us to go upstairs into the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel, not too far behind. 
We sat there in the darkness in silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone and neither did my dad. But as luck would have it, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, when they asked where we lived, they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes, damn. He didn't close the veranda door, and what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us that whatever we hear, to not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he tells us he has to go get the others before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. The maid's daughter is understandably in hysterics, because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They say to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was my dad, with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company, and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police for our jurisdiction and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys had bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen. Which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture and other terrible things to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world and was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me the chills to this day. The cops said the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicates that these guys possibly had sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened had it not been for our incredible dogs. From that day onwards my dad always gave them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved for you angels. This happened last year when I was 17, and it's something I will never forget. I was home alone one weekend while my parents were at a work convention out of state. I was upstairs in my room playing Rocket League with two of my friends, talking to them on my headset when I heard a thump from downstairs. This wasn't unusual because I have two cats who often make a lot of noise while wrestling with each other. So, I resumed my game while turning down the TV slightly to check if the noise persisted. About two minutes later, I heard another thump, followed by what sounded like a grunt. I told my friends about the thumps, and they urged me to check it out, so I did. I began my walk downstairs, thinking my cats were wrestling rougher than usual. But as I got halfway down the stairs, I froze. I could hear what sounded like men whispering to each other coming from the living room. 
Crouching down to get a small peek into the living room, I saw three large men covered in all black, walking around. I can't describe the feeling in my chest when I saw this. Slowly crawling up the stairs from my crouched position, in typical horror movie fashion, the very last step made a very loud creak. The entire house was silent now, and I knew they heard it. Thinking on my feet, I ran quietly to my room, threw on my headset, and told my friends to call the cops and send them to my house. They sounded confused and asked what was going on, but I just urged them to hurry and threw my headset on my bed. As I got to my door to close it, I heard two sets of footsteps coming up the stairs. I knew if I locked myself in my room, they would know where I was. So I closed my door and snuck over to my parents' room, purposely leaving the door open so they wouldn't think to check it. About five seconds later, I heard a pair of heavy boots hit the wooden upstairs floor, accompanied by another set of footsteps. They got louder as they came down the hall and stopped by my door. I heard pounding on my bedroom door, followed by a deep voice saying, open up, before I ran this door down. I got chills hearing this. I made a break for my parents' bedroom window and slid it open quietly, but I must not have been quiet enough because I heard heavy boots go further down the hallway. As I was halfway through the window, a man came into view from the doorway and yelled as he ran towards me. At this point, I jumped out the window, and the man grabbed my ankles, trying to lift me back up. Luckily, I wiggled my feet enough to slip out of my shoes and onto the small roof above my back door. The man followed me out the window as the other man came to the window. I panicked and jumped off the roof, landing awkwardly on my left ankle. The commotion upstairs caused the third man, still downstairs, to spot me through the porch window and run outside to chase me down. I made it to the backyard gate, limping on one foot, before the man grabbed me and pulled me back into the yard. I tried to yell, but the man covered my mouth as the other two men climbed down from the window. All three of the men grabbed me and tried pulling me back into the house. As they got me in the house, I heard the relieving sound of police sirens pulling up. The men looked at each other and said, shit, before pushing me to the ground and fleeing out the back door. Limping on my one leg to the front door, I yanked it open and yelled that the men were in the backyard. Three officers ran into the backyard while one officer helped me over to one of the police cars. They only caught one of the men, while the other two escaped over the fence. They threw the man into the other car as the officers came to question me. Shortly after, my two friends, whom I was playing with, pulled into the driveway on their bikes and rushed over to me to see if I was alright. I told them I was okay and thanked them for calling the police, potentially saving my life. The man that was caught was charged with burglary and attempted kidnapping. It turns out the men broke in through the basement window. I was thankful to escape with my life and only a sprained ankle that night. My lesson to all is to always follow your gut and never ignore any sound you hear while home alone. My roommate was out of the house for the week, so I had the place to myself. It was spring break, so my college classes were out. I had no plans and really nothing I needed to do. On Monday, I was basically trapped inside due to a huge storm blowing through our city. This was common around this time of year, but it still always seemed worse every time. The trees looked like they were going to blow away, and the house would shake and creak nonstop. Knowing I wouldn't be able to sleep, I decided to just stay up. I turned on the Xbox and started up one of my video games and played for well over an hour, probably until 11 o'clock when the doorbell rang. I paused the game and got up, but then I remembered the fact there was a storm happening. Who would be outside right now? I went over to the front door and looked through the peephole, but nothing. I opened the door. The wind and rain hit me right away, but when I looked around, I didn't see anyone. I closed the door and thought maybe the wind had somehow rung the doorbell. I don't know, it sounds dumb now, but what was I supposed to think? I went back to my game, but only a couple minutes later, I heard a huge crash in the backyard. It sounded like stuff tumbling over and breaking. 
I immediately knew it was our patio furniture and ran over to the back door. Everything was scattered around the yard, blowing around in the wind. I quickly put on my shoes and went outside, pushing each piece of furniture up against the back of the house. The wind was so heavy it would even hurt sometimes when the water would hit my face. I was rushing, going as fast as I could until I saw someone. They were standing at the edge of the backyard, watching me. I looked back at them for a moment but then grabbed the last piece of furniture and ran inside to escape the rain. I looked at the back door as I dried off, but the person was gone. Between that and the doorbell ringing, I was a little bit nervous. I sat in the living room this time, just scrolling on my phone because I was tired of being interrupted. After a while, I struggled to keep my eyes open. I got blanket and laid down on the couch. I didn't feel like going upstairs, and the storm was much louder up there. It took a while, but eventually, I drifted off to sleep. A few hours later, still well into the night, I woke up from a sudden burst of heavy wind outside shaking the house. I pulled the blanket to the side and sat up, moving my feet to the floor as I prepared to go check if the furniture outside was still there. But just when my feet touched the floor, they were soaked. It woke me up immediately. I looked down and saw a puddle on the ground right next to the couch. Then I saw another and another, leading in a line across the floor. Inside the puddles were faint muddy shoe prints. I stood up and ran to the corner of the room, heart beating rapidly in my chest. After a minute of hearing nothing but the wind outside, I slowly followed the shoe prints. They led all throughout the house, upstairs and downstairs, but I could clearly tell that they entered through the back door, which I had stupidly forgotten to lock in the rush of getting out of the rain. I locked it and pulled my phone out to call 911, but then the thought crept into my mind, what if they're still inside? I stayed quiet and moved into the corner of the house where I felt the most hidden and called. I waited in silence for them to arrive. When they did, they took a look around, seeing everything I saw, but nothing more. They told me it seems like a personal attack because nothing was missing and they were clearly focused on my house in particular. However, they walked right up to me while I was sleeping and seemingly did nothing but watch me, which is super creepy but doesn't make much sense. If they wanted to do something to me, they would have at that moment. After some thought, this had led me to believe that whoever it was had actually come from my roommates. They saw me, then looked around the whole house, and then left, doing absolutely nothing. So if this was a personal attack and my roommate was there, I think things may have gone a lot worse than they had. I want to share a story about the time my family's house got broken into. It was a really creepy experience. It happened one dark October evening while I was in high school. Back then, whenever I got home from school, I would go up to my room and lie on my bed and read some comics. On the day of the break-in, it was just me in the house. My family had gone shopping, so I shut myself in my room and lost myself in my books. It was great. I needed the toilet though, so I left my room and that's when I noticed something strange. The smell of tobacco smoke. This was really weird since I don't smoke and no one in my family does either. I'd never smelled this smell before in my house, so I went in search of the source of the smell. I began my search in my little sister's room as I noticed the door was slightly ajar. I pushed the door open and switched on the light and in my little sister's room was a full grown man. There was a stranger in our house. He was holding his shoes in one hand, and he was rummaging through my sister's drawers with his other hand. I guessed that he had taken off his shoes so that he could move around more quietly. My heart stopped, and my skin went as cold as ice. Somehow I managed to ask, what are you doing in here? Despite my fear, he started babbling, creating random excuses, none of which were plausible. It was really crazy. My heart was racing now, and I didn't know what to do, so I just grabbed him by the arm. I didn't want him to escape, and he didn't resist or complain. He kept silent. Luckily, 
My grandfather lived close by, so I let the intruder with me to his house. When we got there, my grandfather called the police. After some time, the police arrived, and they filled us in on the details. After they interviewed him, it turns out that the man lived in one of the apartments across the street that looked directly into our house. Things got really creepy when he told the police that he'd been in our home several times. He said he liked to break in even when there were people in the house. Despite the police interview, the man broke down and confessed. He said the main purpose of his repeated trespassing was the fact that he was drawn to my sister, he had some sort of obsession with her. He told the police that the day I apprehended him, he was looking for some of her underwear to take back to his apartment. He said that the only reason he picked my sister was due to the simple fact that she was his type. He confessed to entering other people's homes too, anyone who was his type. He said that the only reason he went unnoticed by the occupants was that he was very careful not to disturb anything or steal a thing, no one knew he was coming or going. It seemed that this guy had an understanding of our family's movements, our schedules, that kind of thing. It was clear that he'd been watching our house and our family for a long time. He knew how to get in easily, must have searched for a weak point of entry. He had done this many times without being caught, and my guess was that he began to get careless, which was how I was able to catch him. I only caught him due to the cigarette smell. I can't tell you how horrifying it is to find someone standing in a dark room in your house when you're at that age. I literally have no words for how frightened I was. Of course, we threw away all of my sister's underwear. We decided to get her new clothes. I mean, how could she feel comfortable wearing anything that man had touched? I think my sister has suffered mentally with this, and it's a thing I don't speak to her about. I'm just glad I caught him. Who knows what else he might have tried doing. Maybe stealing the clothes was just the beginning. I don't want to think about it. This happened yesterday while both of my parents were at work. For context, my dad's a mailman and my mom is an RV saleswoman, they're always on their feet so neither can pick up their phone very quickly. I do have an older brother, but he's at college two hours away, so he doesn't matter in this story. I was sitting in the living room with my dog when I heard people talking in the hallway. This isn't unusual because I live in a third floor apartment and there's a noisy family next door that brings over friends a lot. This was also a Saturday, so I wasn't expecting complete silence. I obviously just ignored the talking since it's not that loud and I had headphones on. But my dog perked up and walked towards the door with an alert posture. The hair on his back was sticking up, which he never usually does. So I got concerned and took my headphones out. This is when I heard the voices from before, which were two adult men yelling very loudly in the apartment hallway. I got a bit freaked out, so I pushed my dog away from the door, made sure it was locked and crept towards it to make sure they weren't near my place. When I looked out, I couldn't see either of them, and because the only blind spot in my peephole is directly to the right, I knew they were at my neighbors. As I'm leaning against it, my whole front door starts shaking because the men are banging on the neighbor's door and still yelling things like, we can hear you, and come out. But I didn't want to show that I was home. At this point, I grabbed my dog and pulled him into my room while I tried to call my dad, who luckily picked up after a few rings. He told me that I should just stay in my room and stay quiet, and that they would go away. I did stay in my room for the most part, but I called my best friend just to have someone on the phone because my dad couldn't stay talking to me. My room is the furthest from the door, so they definitely wouldn't have heard me whispering to my friend about the situation. After about five minutes, I stopped hearing the banging. I told my friend I was going to check if I could hear anything. When I got out there, I didn't hear the banging anymore, so I moved closer to listen. I looked out of the peephole and I could see one of them pacing. I freaked out again and started creeping back to my room. That's when I heard one of them say, maybe we got the wrong house. This threw me into a full-blown panic attack. Since my identical apartment door is five feet away from my neighbors and all the others are down a hallway, 
if they didn't even know the exact number and they obviously weren't scared to bang on an apartment door so aggressively, they would probably come to my door. So, again, I pulled my dog into my brother's room since it had a lock, and I camped in there. I waited for about 10 minutes before I heard the banging calm down again. I couldn't hear any talking from my position. I was texting my friend, who also lived in the complex, about what was happening. That's when the banging started again, but this time they moved to my door. They went through the same routine, but they were much more aggressive. I could hear them slamming, kicking, and hitting my door, all while yelling for some guy to come out. I called my brother later, and he told me there's no way he could have been involved in this, especially because he's 19, and those men had to have been at least 25. I called my dad again, and in his panic, he told me to go out of the room and tell them there's no guys in the apartment, that I'm just a girl. But I just told them I'm gonna call the cops. I know they weren't just looking to break down a door, and that they were targeting this guy who did them dirty. But I still didn't want to go out there because one, even if they're looking for someone else, I don't know if they have weapons, and in their enraged state, they might just cause harm. But they still have the info on me, which leads me to number two. I'm a high school freshman girl, five foot four, and less than a hundred pounds. Quite frankly, I have no fight in me. For example, I'm terrified of knives, so I brought a bowling pin for my room for protection instead. Plus, I was in the middle of a panic attack. I stood no chance against two adult men at my door, so letting them know I'm a teen girl home alone isn't the best idea. I sat next to my locked bedroom door with my dog as I called the cops. I tried to keep him quiet this whole time, but I didn't want to be suspicious during this situation. I made sure not to talk to my friend while I was out of the room to keep quiet and tiptoe everywhere so they didn't know anyone was home besides the dog. I'm pretty sure they didn't know anyone was home, even though they said, we know you're in there, during their yells. Because earlier, they were unsure if they even had the right place. I was on the phone with the cops for a few minutes before I heard light knocking at my door, making me realize I wasn't so much in shock that I didn't even know the banging had stopped. The operator said it was the cops, so I ended the call and answered the door. The officers told me the guys took off just before they got there, and they asked me a few questions about male family members and if they could have any correlation with this. When I was 19, I was a Marine and had stupidly used my military perks to get a home loan and bought my first house. I moved a barracks room worth of stuff into this place that seemed to me like a palace. Of course, I went out and bought some bar stools, a futon to sleep on until I got bed, and some used coffee tables for my TV. I also had my dog with me. As I unpacked my meager belongings in the living room, I noticed a car had pulled into my drive and blocked me in. I walked out, and there stood a man offering to sell me a home security system. The man was dressed in khakis and a polo with a name tag that I can't recall, and the car didn't have a logo on it. It should have been a red flag for me, but I figured that some people on the job didn't drive company vehicles. He gave me his card, but I don't even remember the name of the company he told me he was representing. Cue the friendly salesman, giving me his pitch about needing a system and all the perks that would come with being able to watch the exterior of my house at any time. As a low-ranking military member, I knew I couldn't afford yet another thing, so my mind was working to try to get this man to go away. I even considered ninja chopping him or whatever it is that we marines do in hand-to-hand -to -hand just to get him to leave. But I'm a sort of passive person, I'm too nice. Nah, let's call it polite. I won't be rude to someone doing their job, I've been in customer service, I can relate. I tried politely declining his offer after he had tried to show me some stuff on his iPad, but you know how persistent these types are. I'll admit to my own stupidity when answering his questions, like giving out too much information. Do you live alone? No, I live here with my wife and our three large dogs. At least I had it in the large part. Her and her dogs hadn't actually moved in yet, and hers were just fat, though they were more vicious than my own good boy. But two women living together probably seemed like easier targets. 
I also mentioned being a Marine when he asked. He seemed a bit shocked but wouldn't be deterred. What kind of security system do you have? My dogs and me. Not the best answer I could have given. I wasn't exactly intimidating. I mean, I would be terrifying if I had a gun or something. I've been using them all my life and I've never missed a target, alive or inanimate. If you would invite me in, I can show you the best places to set up cameras, he mentioned more than a few times. Each time made me more and more creeped out, thinking that he was wanting to potentially rob me, not that there was much to take. Despite being a victim of assault in the past, all I could consider was a possible burglary and made sure we stayed away from my house while we talked. We were outside for about 15 minutes total, me spending most of that time trying to politely get away from him and retreat inside. I was losing my mind with the social niceties and just walked away, leaving him standing alone in my front yard. I walked into my house and locked the door. He got into his car and left. I thought nothing more of it. After some unpacking, I couldn't do much, I had nowhere to put most of it, I ate some junk food and put together the futon. I got it all decked out with my fluffiest blankets, made sure the doors and windows were locked, and went to lay down in the living room. Looking back, I'm not sure why I didn't put it in a bedroom. They all have blinds, and the rooms take a bit of getting to. Perhaps I wanted to be near an exit. For some context, my back door is a double glass pane door. At the time, I didn't have curtains on it, but I did have blinds on the kitchen window. My kitchen, living room, and dining room are all connected, but there's a wall in the living room that I strategically situated my futon against so it couldn't be seen by the back doors or the front door window. Call me paranoid. I had been laying down for a few hours, and at about 11, my dog got off the futon and went to the back doors. My dog is large and looks like a Rottweiler, but he's never hurt anything in his life. He'll greet strangers at the door with a tail wag and hardly barks. He stood back there for a bit and whined a few times. I ignored him, it was probably a squirrel. But then he started growling, a sound that I'll never forget. It sent terror straight through me as I sat alone in the dark. I had only ever felt that fear once, when a mountain lion screamed, and I realized I was powerless against nature. The point is, these sounds are designed to scare you. And it petrified me. I was frozen and wanted to whip out, to hide, to call the cops, but I realized if someone was out there, they'd for sure see my phone light and know where I was. So while my dog stayed stationed at the back door, I talked myself up just enough to move off the couch and investigate, still scared out of my mind. I slunk to the kitchen and grabbed a kitchen knife, one of the only utensils I had, and crept to the kitchen window. I was squatting amongst the cabinets so that I couldn't be seen from any windows, trying to gear up to peel back the blinds. My brain was telling me irrational things, horror stories that I had read come to life. To be real, I was ready to punk out. I'm not a brave person, I was in communications for God's sake. Pretty far from any life-threatening situation, while not one that involves people at my house. In the one space that I should consider safe. My hideout, my protection from anything outside wanting in. I've always been afraid of home invasion, it stems from an incident when I was younger that isn't really worth mentioning further. Point is, if someone dares enter my safe place, it's not safe anymore. I thought I couldn't get more scared in that moment, but then I saw a male figure in my backyard, and my heart jumped out of my chest. He wasn't very far from the window I was looking out of. He was bold enough to not wear anything over his head, and I saw the blonde hair in the moonlight. It only took me a few seconds to recognize the security salesman in the dark. He was on the edge of my porch, watching my back door. Watching my dog. I jumped up quickly, climbed over the bar counter, and turned on the lights as I went towards the back door to let my still growling dog out in hopes that he at least get rid of the man, if not injure him. No dice, as soon as the lights came on, he had just enough time to go jump the low part of the fence to safety before my dog even got off the porch. I didn't sleep that night. My dog sat on the futon with me, calm as could be, having done his job. The next morning, I filed a police report, 
but I couldn't tell them his name or what company he was with, having lost the car he gave me. They sent some patrols through the area, and I found out that all legit salesmen should have an ID upon request. That night, I had two friends stay with me, ready for him to come back. We thought he might have set the whole thing up to scare me into buying home security. He didn't come back. And I haven't seen him since. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even seven yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up some time later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright, I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footsteps as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be placed in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed in an attempt to find me. 
That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pan, which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get the door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and get motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even practiced doing that at my new place, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. My roommate was out of the house for the week, so I had the place to myself. It was spring break, so my college classes were out. I had no plans and really nothing I needed to do. On Monday, I was basically trapped inside due to a huge storm blowing through our city. This was common around this time of year, but it still always seemed worse every time. The trees always looked like they were going to blow away, and the house would shake and creak non-stop. Knowing I wouldn't be able to sleep, I decided to just stay up. I turned on the Xbox and started up one of my video games and played for well over an hour, probably until 11 o'clock when the doorbell rang. I paused the game and got up, but then I remembered the whole storm situation. Who would be outside right now? I went over to the front door and looked through the peephole, but nothing. I opened the door. The wind and water hit me right away, but when I looked around, I didn't see anyone. I closed the door and thought maybe the wind had somehow rung the doorbell. I don't know, it sounds dumb now, but what was I supposed to think? I went back to my game, but only a couple minutes later, I heard a huge crash in the backyard, stuff tumbling over and breaking. I immediately knew it was our patio furniture and ran over to the back door. Everything was scattered around the yard, blowing around in the wind. I quickly put on my shoes and went outside, pushing each piece of furniture up against the back of the house. The wind was so heavy it would even hurt sometimes when the water would hit my face. I was rushing going as fast as I could until I saw someone. They were standing at the edge of the backyard, watching me. I looked back at them for a moment but then grabbed the last piece of furniture and ran inside to escape the rain. I looked at the back door as I dried off, but the person was gone. Between that and the doorbell ringing, I was a little bit nervous. I sat in the living room this time, just scrolling on my phone because I was tired of being interrupted. After a while, I struggled to keep my eyes open. I got a blanket and laid down on the couch. I didn't feel like going upstairs, and the storm was much louder up there. It took a while, but eventually, I drifted off and fell asleep. A few hours later, still well into the night, I woke up from a sudden burst of heavy wind outside, shaking the house. I pulled the blanket to the side and sat up, 
moving my feet to the floor as I prepared to go check if the furniture outside was still there. But just when my feet touched the floor, they were soaked. It woke me up immediately. I looked down and saw a puddle on the ground right next to the couch. Then I saw another, leading in a line across the floor. Inside the puddles were faint muddy shoe prints. I stood up and ran to the corner of the room, heart beating rapidly in my chest. After a minute of hearing nothing but the wind outside, I slowly followed the shoe prints. They led all throughout the house, upstairs and down, but I could clearly tell that they entered through the back door, which I had stupidly forgotten to lock in the rush of getting out of the rain. I locked it and pulled my phone out to call 911, but then the thought crept into my mind, what if they're still inside? I stayed quiet and moved into the corner of the house where I felt the most hidden. I waited in silence for them to arrive. When they did, they took a look around, seeing everything I saw, but nothing more. They told me it seems like a personal attack because nothing was missing and they were clearly focused on my house in particular. However, they walked right up to me while I was sleeping and seemingly did nothing but watch me, which is super creepy but doesn't make much sense. If they wanted to do something to me, they would have done it at that moment. After some thought, this had led me to believe that whoever it was had actually come from my roommates. They saw me, then looked around the whole house, and then left doing absolutely nothing. So if this was a personal attack and my roommate was there, I think things may have gone a lot worse than they had. I lived with my older brother for about four years after I finished school. We shared rent on an apartment together since neither of us could afford anything on our own. But during the fourth year, my brother started making better money and he planned to move out once the lease came to an end. I wasn't making a lot, so I knew I couldn't afford to pay for the apartment alone. I looked around online for a roommate for a few months but decided to move out as well and find a cheaper place. I searched until the last month of our lease at the apartment. My brother had basically moved everything out already and there was a lot of pressure on me to find somewhere quick but with my extremely low budget, it was hard. Eventually, I stumbled across a listing posted by a homeowner renting out a room in their house. The man's name was Evan. I sent him a text to let him know I was interested, then kept searching. He responded within a few minutes. We scheduled a time to call later in the day, and when we did, he explained all the details. He said he lived alone in the house and was renting out his spare bedroom, but I'd be able to use all the other rooms in the house. It sounded great to me, so I agreed to it. A couple of weeks later, I packed everything in a U-Haul and drove down to the house. Between this time, we'd been texting and calling, and he sent me a bunch of pictures, but I hadn't had the chance to view it in person yet. I got there around noon, parking in the driveway. The house was definitely small, but it looked nice from the outside. Evan was standing in the garage, waving me over. He gave me a quick tour, then helped me unload all of my stuff into my room. Evan seemed like a regular man in his mid-thirties, which was almost ten years older than myself, but I didn't really mind. He didn't hold conversations very well, and was somewhat shy. Anyway, we finished moving everything inside, and I dropped the U-Haul off. I Ubered back to the house, and by then, it was almost 8 p.m., and I was really tired. Evan was on the couch, watching TV, so I told him I was going to bed early, and I went to my room. All in all, it seemed like a decent place, and I was happy with it. I unpacked some more, then set up my bed, and by 9 o'clock, I was finally ready to sleep. I walked over to my door to lock it and turn off the lights. But as I reached my hand out, I saw the knob on the door was empty. As in, there was no lock on it. Confused, I opened the door. The lock was on the outside of the door. I stepped into the living room and asked Evan why the bedroom door locked from the outside. He looked confused and said he never noticed that but he would switch it around tomorrow. I shrugged and said okay, then went back to my room. I was tired and not too worried about it but it was definitely an odd find. 
I got in bed and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up. I heard someone moving around in the kitchen, which I assumed was just Evan getting water or something. I closed my eyes again. A minute later, I heard him walking back down the hallway, but as he was passing my room, he stopped. I opened my eyes and looked at the door. He was standing out there quietly for maybe 15 seconds before I heard a click. He locked my door. My stomach dropped and I felt my face go cold as Evan walked down to his room. As soon as I heard his bedroom door shut, I got up quietly and went over to the door. I tried the handle and it wouldn't budge. I stood in shock for a few seconds, coming to the reality that this man I just met has now locked me in a room. My fear started to turn into anger and I called out for Evan, telling him to open the door. It only took a second before I heard Evan let out of his room and over to my door. I heard him place his hand on the door, but he paused for a few seconds before he unlocked it. I swung the door open right away. What the hell was that? I confronted him. Evan was stumbling over his words, saying he just wanted to make sure he was safe because he didn't know me well enough. I understood that concern, but locking someone in a room was not a smart way to go about it. I told him that I was going to pack up and leave in the morning. I stayed up all night on the couch in the living room, waiting for the U-Haul store to open at 9 o'clock. I looked into the hallway, seeing Evan's bedroom door was still closed, hopefully meaning he was still asleep. Then I drove straight there, and drove the U-Haul back to the house. When I went inside, Evan's bedroom door was open. Evan? I called out. I walked over to his room and peeked my head inside. His room was empty. I moved my eyes around the room in disbelief, seeing as things were only getting weirder. I backed out and got straight to moving my stuff. I powered through two hours of moving boxes and taking apart my bed. I only had two boxes left, and I ran inside and picked up another, then rushed to the front door until Evan appeared in the doorway. Move, I said. He stared at me emotionless. After a few seconds, he stepped aside. I hurried past him and shut the box in the U-Haul. The last box was half full of random food I kept from my old pantry at the apartment. I decided to just leave it. Evan was freaking me out and I wanted to get away from him as soon as possible. I started closing the back of the U-Haul before Evan interrupted. You forgot this, he held out the last box. Oh yeah, thanks. I grabbed it from him and climbed back into the truck. I felt him watching me as I stacked the box, and when I turned, he had his hand on the door. He started pulling it down, trying to close me in. I was able to stop him before the door was even halfway down. I shoved him to the ground, but he got up and ran. Not into the house, but off into the trees, away from the property. I didn't know what to think, but I didn't care. I quickly shut the back door and drove away. My brother was nice enough to let me stay with him until I found a new place. I don't know what happened at that house or what would have happened, but there was definitely something very wrong going on. This all happened roughly around four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time I was pretty young. I was single and very keen to have my first experience with someone. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting. We had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him since we had been talking for almost a month. Now even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person. But for some reason, I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions of my life. I invited him to come spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend and I had the place to myself, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around three hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to visit. So he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. 
The whole time he was driving to my place, I had the sickening sense of impending doom. Almost as if something was going to go very, very wrong. I almost texted him multiple times to tell him that I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only ten minutes away by this point. I jumped up as I heard his car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door. But he pushed his way through, and continued to stare at me blankly, all whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me. I hesitantly went along with it, as this was my first experience with someone. He was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only 5 p.m. But I told him it was fine, and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After about an hour, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around, and the sound of him talking. So I made my way upstairs and opened my door, only to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed. He sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes, putting his hands around my neck lightly. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, and it worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat. He asked, Does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am and what I look like? I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends knew he was here. This was a complete lie because I don't have a sister, and my friends were unaware, but something inside of me forced me to say it. After minutes of awkward silence, he stood up to gather his things. I noticed that in his backpack, he had tape, rope, and handcuffs. At first, it didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff, but looking back, I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm going to head home. I have a long drive, and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my door because I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to even look at me or say goodbye. He raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to see if he had left anything because he'd left in a hurry. I found a note on my desk with the words, being nice is what saved you. At the time, I had no idea what the note meant. Now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions toward me. I'm still angry at myself for letting a stranger into my home, which was obviously a big mistake. I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I am just so lucky that I made it out alive. All I know is that he is now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I am glad that he is many miles away from me. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a large, scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often used my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked and at this point he made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. I gripped my rifle aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size, and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. 
he was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop and warned him what would happen, but he just moaned at me like a zombie and shouted, Shoot! Do it! Then he lunged towards me. I took my third shot. I can't recall whether it was buckshot or a slug, but it left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming, and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him, and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator who had heard our entire exchange which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop, or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into a rural area. I've worked a few random jobs in my life. My first one was a summer job at 16, during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and it made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job, but the following summer, I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church, and my sister attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time, her health had begun to take a hit, as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in some exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her stories seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not very hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry, as well as help prep her photos with some minor editing. She would also make me at her company watermark before uploading them. They'd end up on a site where her customers could browse them and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium and cross-country jumping, etc. And for the first several months my job was in her living room, which was basically my office space at the time. Eventually, I was talked into tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer, and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie. I'm not a horse person. But things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons. One who was out of state the other who was in the Navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nathan, I had only heard small things about. He was somewhere on the autism spectrum, but she was never clear on what exactly his diagnosis was. When he finally returned home and I met him for the first time while working in her living room, he seemed like a nice guy. A little odd, but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies, and being a bit of a movie buff myself, Whenever he would venture to the living room to strike up a conversation, it would almost always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to watch. I should point out here that I was 18 and he was in his mid-30s. At some point, he got it in his head that I was interested in him, though he never said anything directly to me. I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as the secretary at the church and Nathan somehow found out. I can only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nathan showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about his feelings. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, 
how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to his church and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, as was the pastor who happened to overhear it. And when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to leave him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We'd never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I got even more uncomfortable around him over the next few weeks. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and keep the conversation short while stressing I had to do work. Eventually he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, my boss's company had closed, and I was working somewhere else. I was friends with both my boss and Nathan on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do while I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me, asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram because she didn't know what a pentacle was and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol but that also paganism has nothing to do with the devil anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nathan telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no, and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. Eventually he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked both of them, deciding I was done with it all. Then he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did, he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he started showing up there. This time I told the managers who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. One of those many encounters, while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer when the both of us heard Nathan shout in our direction. I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them, and they told him his business was no longer welcome there. He stopped showing up at my other job as well for a while. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or check the parking lot for his truck. Then one day, he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got this deer in the headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot, but that was my thought process. What happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it. But before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three, right? I looked at him, horrified. I had him completely blocked from all of my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address, and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now, or that I was married, and I was not friends with anyone who knew them. How's your husband doing? He's good. He's a good man, I said, 
trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Really? Where does he work? At this point I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully another employee approached and I got the hell out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me. I'll see you again. We'll talk. We'll go out and do something together. We will. I reported him to the managers, telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV, and while I have not heard anything, I'm guessing one of them finally managed to approach him because I haven't seen him since. This has been going on for 10 years and I want it to finally be over. If he shows up again, I'm going to the police, but I'm seriously hoping it never comes to that. I just want him to stop. I haven't seen him since the incident with my managers. I think he may have gotten scared off. Turned out one of my coworkers used to work with him too at a different job and she also made a complaint about him to the managers. I don't know what they did with that information afterwards, but I know he hasn't shown up since. It sounds like they plan to call the cops if he sets foot in the store again. With two employee complaints of stalker-like behavior, they refuse to ignore that. In 2002, I was 14 years old, starting freshman year. I was an awkward nerdy girl that didn't know how to handle attention from boys, so you could say I made things worse for my situation. I had a knack for making friends with the weird people no one liked, but I tried to be friendly with everyone I met so it wasn't a big deal to me. Unfortunately, that was also my downfall. Clubs were a big deal, and they actually had an anime club, so of course I was all about that. First club meeting, I sat next to a couple of friends and soaked it all up. I thought I was finally with my people. Then here comes Stalker Kid. I'd use his real name, but to this day I have no clue what it is. He sat in front of me, and being that person I said hi. I could tell he was uncomfortable and didn't know anyone so I was just being nice. And boy did this guy cling to me for that one word. At first, he would just find me during lunch and just stand there mumbling things to me. He had such a soft voice, high-pitched, mousy little guy that you just felt unnerved when he spoke to you. The way he would look at you as he spoke, I could never look him in the eyes. After a while, it became more asking about my personal life and what I was into. Me being dumb and naive, I tried to be friendly and chat while feeling incredibly uncomfortable. After a while, me and my friends would move to different tables, benches, even always to avoid him, but he always found me. After about a year of this, my best friend finally told me that if I didn't tell him to F off, he would. I really didn't want him around anymore, so, sure, go ahead. So one day during lunch, here comes Stalker Kid with his signature greeting. Barely above a whisper. Hey Nancy. My buddy just goes, dude, she's not interested, F off. Looking hurt, he shuffled away. I was like, man you didn't have to be so hard on him, but thanks. I didn't see him much around school after that except for club days where he would just sit across the room and stare at me while my best friend glared at him. Cut to me being 16 and now driving to school. Minus the awkward club days, I didn't really notice anything from him. That is until an old gray beat-up car started parking next to me, extremely close. One day after school, he was waiting for me in that car. He started asking me how I've been, talking about prom, and all that stuff. I was trying to rack my brain on how he knew that was my car, unless he had been watching me before and after school. I started getting there later and leaving later to avoid him, because he was like clockwork. Finally, a boy I used to be friends with in elementary school was walking out with me and made a comment about how that guy is always next to my car and asked if he was my boyfriend. I immediately said no, and he's always following me around, and I hated it. It was really starting to freak me out. Bless this guy, because he walked right up to him and scared him off, threatening if he ever parked near me again he would kick his ass. 
I figured maybe that was enough to keep him away. So again, there was a small space where I would hear nothing of him except for my friends who had classes with him telling me how creepy he was. One friend had our class with him and said he would draw naked women constantly in his books. Junior year is wrapping up, and I started giving my best friend Jack lifts to school. He was on my way, so I figured why not. At some point, Jack started noticing that little gray car was always heading the same way after school and made a joke about stalker kid living next to him. Small world, right? I could only be so lucky. One day, as per usual, little gray car was following us, so we took a detour. Sure enough, he was with us every step of the way, and it was no longer a joke. We both started freaking out. I pushed the gas pedal as hard as my foot could push it and got the hell out of sight. A few other things happened. In order to get into prom, he had to ask someone from my ear. So he asked some random girl from my softball team and then dumped her as soon as he got in. He then followed me all night. This includes to the after prom, where I had to avoid him the whole time. Our high school had a TV channel for kids to run, and during prom they would record the whole night. It took one of my friends to point it out, but throughout the whole video, it showed him behind me and following and staring at me all night. I didn't even realize. And the one that still creeps me out to this day is graduation for his class. I was scanning the crowd to see my friends who were graduating when I saw a hand wave as I passed by. I looked back, and of course it was stalker kid waving at me. How he picked me out of a crows of thousands I will never know. 2006 senior year was great, no signs of creepy stalker kid, to the point where I kind of forget about him. I graduate, I choose a college in town, get a job at a local retail store and move on. Life was beginning to be normal. I work the gaming department, so you get the weird guys once in a while. One that I saw a lot was this little Mexican guy with glasses, who never purchased anything but would just walk around from time to time. Then, stalker kid comes strolling in the doors and walks into gaming and just talks. I ask how he knew I worked here. He says his friend saw me and knew we were friends. I tried to radio for help for someone to come and get him out. Finally, a big guy from computers walks by and asks for my help in the back. Once he pulls me to safety, I tell him everything. From that point, security is aware and is told to watch for this guy. Of course he wasn't doing anything physical so all they could do for me is watch out for him. So every time he came in, they would tell me and I would dip back to the warehouse. I started seeing his friend, who he called Ninja, constantly and all he ever did was walked around on his phone. I began to suspect he was texting stalker kid to tell him I was at work, because sure enough, 10 minutes later, he would come in. So I tested this theory and started walking randomly around the store. At one point, a friend who worked register asked why I would do this, so I had her take a walk with me on her break. I told her this ninja guy would follow us everywhere, even just going down a random aisle. Sure enough, he did, and she began freaking out. A few minutes later, I told her, my stalker would walk through those doors. So I'm making my way to the warehouse, and out steps ninja guy from an aisle and he shouts, she's right here. I just stared at him, like, what the hell do you think you're doing? Stalker kid walks up behind me and asks why I'm always running away from him, and says that he lost my number, and asks if I can give it to him again. I say sure knowing damn well that I never gave it to him. I go to the warehouse to get a pen and paper. I wrote down, this is where I work, don't ever come here again, and handed it to him. I told him and his friend to leave and call for security, who walked him out. Security tells me later that he also cried while they took him out. Later that day, as I'm leaving work, security offers to walk me to my car. I say sure. Stalker kid is out by my car waiting for me, so this is where security says he's not having it, and calls the police, which we are conveniently next to their headquarters. He books it when he sees the car. Few years go by, nothing comes up. I buy a fancy new car, and don't see him much. I'm thinking that did the trick, and I'm finally free. 2012, 
My buddies and I are leaving work, ready to hit the night at the bar, per usual. We are all walking out the door, where we all have to stand and wait to hear the alarm sound to verify it's armed. As we are walking out, I hear it. That awful sound. Hey Nancy. I cringe, grab my friend's arm and turn. There he is leaning on his car, waiting. My friend recognizes him and asks what he wants. Guy says he just wants to talk to me. He said he didn't ever see my car so he didn't think I worked here anymore. His other friend is sitting in the back seat of his car just staring at me blankly. I start to think the worst. If my friends leave me here, something tells me I'm not coming into work the next day. Or ever. I'm terrified that he's had years of time to think about our last encounter where I wrote my number down and made him cry. I grab my friend's arm tighter. My friend kicks off, pretends to be my boyfriend and rips into him. My friend is about two feet taller and much bigger. They get into it, and I'm just standing in the parking lot and I'm just begging for my friend to kick his ass. He spooks stalker kids so bad that I'm pretty sure he pissed himself before getting in his car and booking it. Ever since, if he comes into the store, my friend stares him down from his office. Years later, I've moved on, gotten married, and moved out of town. Recently we've moved back to start a business, and to this day, I still feel myself looking behind me at stores on the off chance that I randomly bump into him. He caused me to have anxiety, mental and emotional pain, fear and trust issues for a decade. Even after moving on, I still feel the effects today. And I never even knew his name. I'll begin by giving a little background. At the time this happened, I was a 16-year-old girl working at a chain coffee place while in high school. I am 19 now, and in college, seven hours away from this place. This happened at a time in my life in which I was super shy and had a tough time standing up for myself. In retrospect, I could have handled it a lot better. I used to work closing shifts with my best friend after school, it'd be from like 3 to 10 p.m. We worked at a relatively dead store, so we spent most of our time playing music and talking. We did our duties like taking the trash out and restocking etc., although both of us always dreaded taking the trash out, as we had to go out back. The dumpsters were behind the store, in a dimly lit area, next to a sketchy liquor store. One night a man came in pretty late, it wasn't unusual to have customers come near closing, it was just uncommon to see anyone we didn't already know. Our store was mostly just regulars. He was lanky, and probably around 30. I mostly just remember his eyes. They were piercing, the type that never break a stare. I remember initially thinking he was attractive, yikes. The way he spoke was short and concise, just ordering a small hot latte. I made his order and that was it. I told my friend about how I thought he was attractive, and we then started referring to him as the small hot latte guy. We always call people by their drink orders. He came a bunch of times after that. Each time staying a little longer and longer, talking a little more and more. One day he came with a woman, presumably his girlfriend. I remember I felt a little weird, like she was staring at me, or like they had spoken about me beforehand. She glanced over at him and said, Wow, she is pretty. I didn't think much of it, said thank you, serve them, and I thought that would be the end of it. He then began showing up and talking to me a lot without her. He started off as being friendly, I honestly don't even know what we talk about. Then he got kind of flirty. Initially I was just flattered, but being underage and immature, I didn't even think about the fact that it was kind of alarming. He began to stay for a while. Sometimes he would bring a laptop or a notebook. I could feel him staring at me and listening to our conversations. But at that point I wasn't getting creepy vibes from him as my coworker and I had dealt with our fair share of creeps. He began by just giving little snacks or drinks. I would accept but would never eat or drink them. 
It wasn't that I necessarily thought he had ill intentions, I just had a hard time accepting gifts. I remember one night he brought me a book about one of his favorite artists. I reluctantly took it but had tried to decline before. I remember telling him about one of my favorite musicians and sent him a link to a performance I really liked. He started being kind of sexual while still talking about the song. He then began talking super suggestively and I would laugh it off and decline when he asked to send pictures. I began talking less and less and told my friend about the situation. She agreed that it was getting creepy and said I should maybe change my schedule. I told her I'd be fine, I'm stubborn. He'd still come every week at closing time and he'd even stay in his car till we closed. Meaning he'd watch me go to the back to take the trash out. It was time to take out the trash and lock up, so we got ourselves together. I was opening the door while juggling like three bags of trash and saw something on the ground. I was confused at first but then realized what I saw. It was flowers and a note. I felt sick to my stomach and looked around the parking lot. I didn't see his car. I threw them away immediately and told my friend I didn't want to read the note. She read it and told me I had to. It was something to the effect of. I've never felt so connected to someone. You're breaking my heart. Please don't do this. I'm sorry. Looking back, I honestly didn't lead him on, but initially I felt as if I was in the wrong. Nonetheless, we turned the corner to take the trash out and both prayed the parking lot was empty. It was not. Let's just say the trash was not going to get taken out that night. I continued working there and still worked there on my breaks from college. I had different hours after that. Nothing happened for some time until one day he appeared again just before I was supposed to leave for college. It was around 3 p.m. It was busy, he came in, stared at me, and then he left. That was the last time I saw him. Looking back I was so naive and could have handled the situation so much better. I am forever thankful to my friend, she really supported me that whole time. A year ago, I used to post my entire life to Snapchat. It was my go-to app for sharing bits of my life with friends and family. But then something happened that made me reconsider my online presence. One day, out of the blue, I received a friend request from an unfamiliar username. I didn't think much of it at the time and accepted the request without a second thought. It was just another random person, or so I assumed. Months passed and I forgot about that peculiar friend request. My life went on, and I continued sharing snippets of my daily activities on Snapchat. Little did I know that someone was watching, very closely. It started innocently enough, with an unexpected snap. I opened it, thinking it was probably a friend sharing a funny meme or a cute pet photo. But as the image loaded, my heart almost stopped. It was an eerie, edited version of an old Snapchat story I had posted months ago. Floating love hearts surrounded the image, and the caption read, Can't wait to see you. The chill running down my spine was hard to ignore. How did someone get access to my old stories? Who was behind this? Days turned into weeks, and more edited snaps kept arriving. Each one featured pictures taken from my past stories. The captions became increasingly unsettling, referring to my personal life. How was your McDonald's on Friday? And another said, I love that movie you watched last night. The sense of being watched was inescapable. I felt exposed and vulnerable, as though a stranger had invaded my privacy. It wasn't long before I decided to check Snap Maps, the feature that lets you see the real-time locations of your friends. My heart raced as I zoomed in on the map. There it was, a bit too close for comfort, the location of this creep. He was nearby, and the thought sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was no ordinary prank or trolling. It felt personal, like someone was playing mind games with me. Fear gripped me as I realized the mysterious friend was getting closer to my location. 
I knew I had to act fast. I began taking screenshots of the disturbing snaps for evidence. Then, I contacted the local authorities and reported the unsettling situation. The investigation that followed uncovered the identity of the creep. To my shock, it turned out to be someone I met at a party months ago. I'd been warned about how creepy and weird he was. He would just invite himself to parties and nobody wanted to be rude and kick him out, so we just tolerated him. To be fair, I had no issue with him and spoke with him a little bit throughout the night, but didn't see much of him. I guess being nice to the social outcast when everyone else kept him at arm's length was enough for him to become obsessed with me. They didn't end up charging him with anything, but they told him to leave me alone and explained to me that I could get a restraining order, but I didn't see the point. This happened a couple of months ago, December of last year. I started working a new job in the mall and had to work for most of Boxing Day. I was done at 10 and transit seemed to have ended at 7. I'm a student who didn't go home for the holidays due to this job and never had to deal with holiday transit hours. I decided to call an Uber and the driver picked me up right in front of the mall. We had a casual conversation during the drive back and he learned about where I worked and how I'm living on my own for the time being since my roommates went to their hometowns. Fast forward to the next day at work, around 6 p.m. This driver walks into the store and tries to strike a conversation with me, but I told him I had to get back to work. He also asked if we could hang out later, to which I said no, and he left. At the end of that shift, I walked out of the store, planning to take transit. As soon as I stepped out of the store, the driver immediately pulled up next to me and offered to give me a free ride back home. After going back and forth with me declining and him saying it's free, I decided to walk away and caught a bus home. I was pretty overwhelmed by the fact that he showed up to my workplace and waited three hours until I was done with work to offer me a ride home. I've reported this to Uber and they notified me that they suspended this driver, provided me with a full refund and gave me a link to provide to the police if I plan on filing a report. Silly of me to give away information like that to a stranger, but I hope to never meet that driver again. He was about twice my age, he knows where my home is, and my name. Lesson learned. Many years ago, I used to work the night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. During the season, it wasn't too bad, mostly families and tourists. We had on-site security back then. However, in the off-season, the winter months were different. The cheap weekly rates we offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to be to make money in the off-season by renting to snowbirds, older retired people who came to the beach for about a month through the winter. It did not always work out that way. The cheap rates made it possible for a less than desirable element to become long-term residents. I've discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and more during the winter months. Working the third shift, I would meet some interesting people. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in to get warm and grab some free coffee. I wasn't supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't cause trouble. As you can see, night shift in the winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have a lot, but this one is one that stands out because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up to this point. I had gone to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked the second shift in exchange for her working an hour late for me. Ironically enough, I met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore matches. Little did I know I was about to experience this kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11 p.m. I counted the register and she briefed me on her shift as to what had happened, as per usual. As she was leaving, my friend Andrew arrived. 
He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel and the other two hotels our company owned. He would regularly stop by after work, go grab us some food, and we would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating for a while since business was slow. He was just getting my money for the food, getting ready to leave. I was excited, telling him about how much fun I had at the wrestling show and showing him my Terry Funk t-shirt that I was so proud of. I was just walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. It's true what they say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I had turned around when I heard someone say something loudly, but I still couldn't make out what they had said. I had just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew fall down in front of me. The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and punches me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me, and I fell to the ground. Before I could react, he hits me in the head with the pipe. I suddenly heard another guy that I hadn't even noticed. He was panicking because he thought that one of us had ran to get a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but it was having issues. I slammed it in frustration. I was hurting and scared, really freaking out. I realized that they could come back, so I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone, and that worried me. I called 911 and started to notice the blood pouring down my head. I told the operator I had been attacked and needed an officer and an ambulance. I then called Travis, the manager of the hotel, to tell him what had happened. He thought I was messing with him at first because when we got bored, we would usually prank each other. I finally convinced him I was not joking. So he told me he was heading over straight away. The cops and the ambulance pulled up and I opened the door. It was at this time I found out that after they sucker punched him and knocked him down, Andrew was able to amazingly jump over the desk and escape. He ran out just as a cop was driving by, which he ran to flag down for help. I ended up in the hospital emergency room where I had to have 10 staples in my scalp and they gave me morphine for pain. I had no way to get home after being treated, but the doctor and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to go back to work because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, the IT guy Ted was there with his wife Barbara, who also worked at the front desk. She was shocked to see me, she thought I would still be in the hospital. I thought I had only been hit in the head once after being punched. But the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to the ground, the guy had hit me not just one time, but ten times in total. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up, for some reason. I do not remember that, I guess I was knocked pretty hard. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe until his friend told him that Andrew got away and then got the cops. The two of them then ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel. And Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there as I was in no condition to drive due to the morphine. They also gave me a paid week off to heal. They switched me over to the other hotel on the night shift for a month, just in case they were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. The police thought it might be a failed strong arm robbery due to Andrew getting away and me not just going down. Not knowing why they attacked me really shook me up. Even though I was at our other hotel when I came back to work the night shift, I was still nervous. I tensed up every time the door chimed. I couldn't afford to quit, as I said, I had three kids I was supporting. They never caught the guys as far as I know. A detective stopped by about two months later when I was working the second shift. He showed me several mug shots and asked me if any of them looked familiar. I never got a great look at them as it all happened so fast. I had seen the video, which wasn't the best quality. Even so, two of them looked very familiar. I pointed them out, and he asked me how sure I was. I told him honestly, like 85%. He then yelled and asked me if I wanted someone to go to jail for attempted murder on 85%. I was stunned into silence. I was the victim. I was attacked for no reason, 
and he is yelling at me like it's my fault. I was too busy being attacked to get a good look at them. I no longer work in a hotel on the night shift, and I'm glad, because it's just too dangerous in this area. Night shifts at hotels can be risky, and after my terrifying experience, I decided it was time for a change. For a while, the memories of that night haunted me. The feeling of being so vulnerable, the pain from the attack, and the lingering questions about the attacker's motives all weighed heavily on my mind. But over time, I began to heal, both physically and emotionally. I found a new job with better working hours and conditions, which provided me with the opportunity to spend more time with my kids. The sense of safety and security that had been shattered during that fateful night gradually returned. Life moved on, and I left the hotel industry behind. I learned that sometimes, it's necessary to prioritize your well-being over financial concerns. My new job allowed me to support my family while maintaining a more stable work-life balance. I never did find out what motivated the attackers that night. They remained at large, leaving behind a trail of questions and unresolved mysteries. However, I chose not to dwell on the past but to look forward to a brighter future. Though the scars on my scalp served as a physical reminder of that harrowing night, they also symbolized my resilience and ability to overcome adversity. It was a chapter of my life that had come to an end, and I was determined to write a new, safer, and happier story for myself and my family. I need to preface this by saying that I don't believe in ghosts or any other kind of paranormal activity. This is not an attempt to convince people of their existence. What I will say is that I have an open mind regarding things that I can't explain using logic or reasoning. I know something happened to me, I just don't know what. And nothing I've heard so far has come anywhere near a satisfactory explanation. But then, that's what had me creeped out about it. If I could just chalk it up to seeing a ghost or witnessing a glitch in the matrix, as I've heard people call it, or any of that, at least I could draw a line under it and move on. But I can't. Because I have no idea what happened that night, and neither does anyone else. I used to work for a security company that contracted overnight work for large office buildings in downtown Houston. Some of the buildings were real nice places, and their security offices had all kinds of amenities that others just didn't have. The only problem was they made for some of the most boring overnight shifts you could possibly imagine. Tough guards can be exhausting and dangerous, but boredom is a different kind of poison altogether. So you understand why I say, out of all the places that I could have expected my scariest night working security, these places didn't get anywhere near the top 10. One of the buildings we worked in had a bunch of different offices on each floor with a layout, each one being shaped like a letter U. Each of the floors was owned by a different company for the most part. Anyway, so most had a different design but the same layout, and part of that layout were those polished metal plates that sat on the corner of each corridor. They were positioned at the 90 degree angles in the U shape. At first, I figured it was just an odd design choice. Then I figured out that they were like mirrors. If someone was walking down the connecting corridor and you couldn't see them, you'd be able to see a little movement in the polished metal so you wouldn't run into anyone or get a fright. Kind of clever, right? Well, listen to this. One night, I'm working the overnight shift with two other coworkers. When it comes my turn to perform a physical sweep of the building, we had most of the building mapped out with cameras, but no security guard worth his salt relies on electronics. So every half hour, one of the guards would take a quick walk around each of the floors just to make sure everything was A-OK. -okay. Most of the guys would just take elevators up and down, but it was around this time that I decided to take the stairs a few times a night to get some exercise. I was a few pounds heavier than I wanted to be, and walking up even five or six flights of stairs sucked. So I took as many flights as I could, then took the elevator the rest of the way. It also helped kill time on those hellish shifts. Anyway, this one time, I managed to hustle all the way up to the ninth floor, which was totally a new record for me. But I was completely out of gas. I literally had to lean against the wall to catch my breath, 
making sure to stay in the stairwell's blind spots so my co-workers wouldn't watch and laugh at me. Once I had myself together again, I walked out into the corridor and towards the first bend in the U-shaped layout that I mentioned earlier. As I got within a few feet of it, I froze. For the first time in the whole time that I'd worked there, I saw a reflection in the polished metal mirror thing. It wasn't crystal clear, but it was absolutely different to how it usually looked. I had the usual reflective image ingrained into my memory because I saw it hundreds of times a night. I could clearly see someone standing in the connecting hallway, wearing what looked to be the same kind of security uniform as me. I called out, thinking it was one of my co-workers. Then the white shirt shape suddenly moved out of sight. Now, right away, I thought this was a prank. I caught them trying to scare me. So, as I'm walking around the corners, I'm kind of calling out, Hey, I know you're there. I saw you in the reflection. I get around each corner, but I don't see anyone. I assume the guy had ducked into one of the conference rooms or offices as a backup. I checked all of them, and they were all empty. I called down on my radio to make sure someone was really up there with me and they're just hiding in a closet or something because they're a bunch of immature idiots. The second I heard both guys talking on the same radio, I felt myself getting just a little bit freaked out. Either I was having some kind of weird episode after power walking up those nine flights, where my eyes were playing tricks on me, or something very bad was happening. So, naturally, I'm starting to get a little worried. Not majorly worried, just a little. I decided to take the elevator the rest of the way. I was still concerned about my health, but then as I'm walking back towards it, something happened that makes me feel cold just to think about to this day. It felt like someone walked up behind me, and it felt like it was fast. I heard the footsteps that definitely weren't my own, and I felt that feeling of imminent danger you get when someone rushes you from behind. I turned, had my hand on my sidearm, ready to defend myself. But there was nothing there. Just an empty corridor with me standing in it. I can't even really think of the words for the kind of fear that I was feeling in that moment. The best that I can come up with is it was like a physical force, and that fear hit me and pushed me towards the elevator at a speed walk. I was convinced that someone was up there with me. But at the same time, they either had to be psychic or a ninja to rush up on me like that, or at least make me feel like I was being creeped on. None of it made any sense, and more and more, I was thinking that there was something wrong with me, not that something weird was going on. Once I was safely in the elevator, I called down to my coworkers and asked them to watch all of the cameras on the 10th floor for any kind of movement. They replied, asking if I was all good or if I needed help, probably because they could hear the state I was in. But I told them to shut up, watch the cameras, and tell me if they could see anything or anyone. I was expecting a no, in which case I had to accept that I was having some kind of medical emergency and maybe even call 911. I heard about people having strokes or heart attacks and how they can feel confused or panicked, so that's all my hypochondriac mind was thinking about. But then, as my radio crackled to life again, I heard the next thing they said, and I swear to Christ that I felt like I was going to throw up. My coworker came back with, Yeah, there's someone up there with you. We're headed for the elevator right now. I sent it down to the ground floor, and if I'm being honest, I was weirdly relieved. I wasn't about to have a stroke, and I wasn't going crazy. There really was someone up on the 10th floor, and they were about to get messed up for scaring the living daylights out of me. We swept all the rooms together, calling out to this potential intruder the whole time, saying things like, come on out, and you're only getting trespassing, and even saying things like, this is a heck of a way to get yourself shot. We were just bluffing, and it wasn't a huge issue that we didn't find this intruder. They could have easily used the stairwell to escape to another floor. But instead of going and hunting them down, we just headed back down to the security office, watched the cameras, and waited for the real cops to show up. On the way back to the office, I asked my coworker what exactly he'd seen on those security cameras, and it turns out he hadn't seen anything definitive, just enough blurry movement on the edges of a monitor to know that someone was definitely up there. And they seemed like they knew where the camera's blind spots were. This is what really sent alarm bells ringing for my coworkers. 
Stuff like that suggests someone has cased the place, done a little recon in the daytime, possibly disguised as a client or employee. They know where to go to get whatever they come for, as well as how to get there without being spotted straight away. A lot of people have asked me how this person could have gotten into the building in the first place, and didn't that bother me at all? The question did bother me, but we're not trained to waste time thinking about how. We're trained to react to intruders as and when they occur, to focus on either locking them down for the cops or getting them out of the building without anyone getting hurt. You focus on the how afterward. In the moment, you focus on the intruder. Anyway, we watched the cameras, called the cops, and tried to work out where this intruder could have gotten to while avoiding all the security cameras. We stared at the cameras for maybe 15 to 20 minutes before the cops showed up and we didn't see any movement. When the cops arrived, we helped them sweep all the floors and offices to make sure no one was around. They were pretty thorough about it. Opening up closets and checking under desks. But still, we found no one. Even the cops said that it must have been spooky for whoever was up there alone, which sounded like the understatement of the century. But right then, when we were dealing with the situation, I was sure that it wasn't just me going nuts. The situation was resolving itself, so I was relatively calm again. When the cops left, we switched on the alarm systems for floors 9 to 13, meaning if anyone entered those floors again, we'd be instantly alerted, and a 911 call would automatically be issued. No alarms were triggered that night, so we figured the episode was pretty much over and done with. We'd have to talk to the head of security about it, and there was no doubt that he'd be very interested in how he let something like that happen. But no one expected to get fired. In the weeks afterward, I realized how much the experience had affected me. The longer I went on wondering about it, the worse the feeling got. I thought I had put it behind me, but it turned out to be a major error in judgment on my part. Or maybe I just ignored my feelings. I thought about what could have made those noises and reflections. What could have given me that feeling like someone was rushing up behind me? After thinking about it for long enough, I decided that I didn't want to work there anymore. When I was told that I couldn't pick and choose which guard shifts I was on, I was left with no choice but to seek employment elsewhere. I'm not afraid to admit that I was scared of whatever happened up there. Rather than going down some crazy rabbit hole trying to explain it, I thought it was better just to walk away and start fresh someplace else. It's never happened again, nor anything like it, but you can bet your bottom dollar that if it does, I'm out of there. A couple of years ago, I was living in Colombo, in Sri Lanka, at a small hostel on the outskirts of the city. The hostel catered to long-term guests, so I got to know everyone who lived there pretty well. Among the residents, there was a guy named Raj, and Raj served as a middleman of sorts in the local casinos. The casinos in the area were incredibly shady places, filled with Russian mobsters and other low-life criminals from China and India. While the casinos were technically illegal, they managed to continue their operations through bribery and government coercion. I visited one of them once, and it was a surreal experience. Now, my friend Raj's job was to take online bets from Indian clients and then place those bets physically in the casino. Essentially, he played with their money and acted as the intermediary, allowing individuals to play from another location. He participated in some high-stakes games, handling large sums of money for some powerful people. It was a recipe for disaster waiting to happen. One night, Raj messed up big time. One of his clients managed to gain access to his online system and stole all the money his other clients had deposited to play with. The amount stolen was significant, with some losing well over $50,000, a fortune in this area. We only found out about the theft after Raj's sudden disappearance, and we discovered a cryptic note left in his bed, saying, It's sad, don't look for me, I'm leaving. Among other things, the guy had vanished overnight. We filed a police report and waited to hear anything. After a few days, the police returned to the hostel, asking if someone who knew Raj could join them. 
The locals in the hostel were afraid to go with the police, so I volunteered. They took me to their headquarters, leading me to the back where I was shown photos of a body cut into pieces. It was Raj, brutally dismembered and dumped into the nearby sewer canal by an unknown assailant. They brought me there to identify the body, but they never found out who was responsible for this gruesome act. The images from those photos have haunted me, and I'll never forget them. I left the hostel shortly afterward. Raj might have been involved in some shady activities, but he didn't deserve such a gruesome fate. I work as a baker for a small bakery in a tourist town. I'm regularly at work around midnight most nights. I'm pretty close to the local strip of bars and clubs, so I hear late night party goers, sirens a few times a night, and people yelling. That kind of stuff. The weirdest story, which started out creepy but didn't end that way, was when I opened the door around 4am to someone knocking. The only reason I opened the door is because my boss had literally just texted me saying we might be getting an early delivery, so I thought it was that. I opened the door and no one's there. I glanced around, thinking they knocked and ran back to their truck to start unloading. Then suddenly, someone steps out of the shadows, looking like Slender Man. I panic but hold it together pretty well. Once they got out of the shadows, it obviously wasn't a monster. It was just a tall, skinny girl with no pants on, no shoes, and a shirt that obviously wasn't hers. This poor girl then asks me if she can borrow a phone. It clicks in my mind what could have happened, and I tell her to come in. I let her use my phone. She tries to call her boyfriend and tells me that essentially she just woke up after passing out. She didn't know where she was, and I was the only light on the street. I didn't ask what happened to her, but she was saying something about pulling a firearm earlier and was hyperventilating over the cops being called on her, so I didn't call them. Her boyfriend never answered the phone, but I helped her figure out where her hotel was. Luckily, it was on the same block we were already on. I couldn't leave to walk with her or drive because I had a million things in the oven. I actually gave her my phone with the place pulled up on Google Maps and the flashlight on. She walked there, made it back okay, showered, took a nap, and brought me back my phone later in the morning. She hugged me twice and thanked me profusely, and I'm just sitting there like, damn, I didn't think I was getting my phone back. But I'm glad it worked out okay. I don't know if she was assaulted or just the type to strip when drunk or what, but she seemed okay after having been back to her hotel room. It could have gone a lot worse for her, so I'm glad I was the door she knocked on. Dodd, did she give me a heart attack at first? A few years back when I was doing any work I could get, I took up this gig at the 24-7 Walmart. It was a bit more rundown than your typical Walmart. Dimly lit aisles, flickering fluorescent lights, and an eeriness that only an empty Walmart at 3 in the morning can provide. So picture this, I'm stocking shelves in the cereal aisle, just trying to keep myself awake with the monotonous routine. And then, out of nowhere, this guy saunters in. He's tall, I mean basketball player tall, with long strides that make him seem like he's on some sort of mission. There's hardly anyone around, and this dude's pacing down the aisles like he owns the place. Kind of weird, but not out of the ordinary Walmart weird. Just a late night shopper with a peculiar vibe. I'm busy stacking cereal boxes when I catch sight of him again. He's standing at the end of the aisle, staring at me with this grin that could send shivers down your spine. The lighting's wonky, casting these creepy shadows that don't help my nerves. Before I can even process what's happening, he's right there, right in front of me. Close enough that I can smell the alcohol on his breath. He shoots me this look, like he's got the juiciest secret in the world, and then he says, I've done something very naughty. What the hell? I try to laugh it off, brush it away with a nervous chuckle. 
but he's not having it. He keeps staring, that grin still plastered on his face. It's late, it's quiet, and the place is kind of creepy already. But this guy, he's turned it up to ten. He starts following me, aisle after aisle. Every time I turn around, there he is, watching and grinning. It's like he's playing a twisted game of hide and seek, and I'm not even a player. More like the unwilling target. I try to go about my work, but I can feel his eyes on me, like they're drilling holes into my back. Then, out of nowhere, he starts humming this tune. It's faint, just under his breath, but it's off-putting as hell. I can't put my finger on where I've heard it before, but it's that famously creepy whistling song. I decide to take a breather and head to the break room. Maybe I can shake him off and catch a few moments of normalcy. My co-worker's in there, and we're shooting the breeze about assignments and exams, trying to keep things light. But the whole time, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. And guess what? I was right. I spot him at the entrance to the break room, just standing there, staring right at me. I freeze, and I swear the room got colder in that moment. I point him out to my co-worker, and when he turns around, the guy's vanished. I glance at my co-worker, I couldn't read his expression. I ask him, did you see that? He looks at me, the confusion is obvious in his eyes. See what? Clearly he saw nothing. I realize that he missed the entire encounter. It was only me who saw him. I run my fingers through my hair, feeling a mixture of paranoia and frustration. Never mind, I mutter, dismissing the topic. Maybe I'm just letting my imagination get the best of me. It was late and I had not slept properly in days. My co-worker's not as intrigued as I am. He's focused on the task at hand, more interested in getting his work done than in delving into whatever nonsense I was talking about. We head back to our posts, and I'm still rattled. I can't shake the image of that guy's grin. Hours pass, and I try my best to concentrate on my tasks, but the unease is a constant presence in the back of my mind. I keep glancing around, half expecting him to reappear. That creepy grin plastered on his face. And then, out of nowhere, he's back. My heart skips a beat, and my hands tremble. It's like a nightmare come true. He's standing there, that same grin on his face. My breath catches in my throat. Before I can even react, he's sprinting towards me, his steps quick and purposeful. Panic surges through me, and I freeze. What does he want? My mind races, but my body is paralyzed. He grabs me and easily picks me up. He starts shaking me and shouting in my face. And then, as if from a distance, I hear a shout. My coworker's voice cuts through the fear. Hey, what's going on? He's running towards us, his footsteps echoing in the aisle. The guy releases his grip on me, his attention shifting to my coworker. And in that split second, I find my voice. I scream as loud as I can and start beating on the guy. My coworker arrives, his presence enough to make the guy hesitate. He turns and bolts, disappearing down the aisle. I'm left shaking, my heart pounding. My coworker rushes to my side, he looks seriously concerned. Are you okay? He asks me. I nod, I'm completely out of breath from the screaming. We're both shaken, both trying to make sense of the madness that just unfolded. We call the police, and as we wait for them to arrive, I can't help but replay the encounter in my mind. What was that guy's deal? Why did he attack me? The police arrive and we recount the bizarre events. They search the area, but the guy is long gone. I tell him what happened and try to describe just how creepy and weird he was, and I mention that he said he'd done something naughty that night. Suddenly there's like four more cop cars pulling up, and they're taking this real seriously. My manager sent me home for the night and told me I didn't have to come in tomorrow. I checked the news the next day and saw that there had been a hit and run nearby with a suspected drunk driver killing a family of three. 
The description of the suspect was almost exactly the same as the guy who attacked me. What the hell was this guy's problem? As far as I know, they never found him. I check the news occasionally just to see if he comes up, but I've not seen anything since. I lived with my older brother for about four years after I finished school. We shared rent on an apartment together since neither of us could afford anything on our own. But during the fourth year, my brother started making better money and he planned to move out once the lease came to an end. I wasn't making a lot, so I knew I couldn't afford to pay for the apartment alone. I looked around online for a roommate for a few months but decided to move out as well and find a cheaper place. I searched until the last month of our lease at the apartment. My brother had basically moved everything out already and there was a lot of pressure on me to find somewhere quick. But with my extremely low budget, it was hard. Eventually, I stumbled across a listing posted by a homeowner renting out a room in their house. The man's name was Evan. I sent him a text to let him know I was interested, then kept searching. He responded within a few minutes. We scheduled a time to call later in the day, and when we did, he explained all the details. He said he lived alone in the house and was renting out his spare bedroom, but I'd be able to use all the other rooms in the house. It sounded great to me, so I agreed to it. A couple of weeks later, I packed everything in a U-Haul and drove down to the house. Between this time, we'd been texting and calling, and he sent me a bunch of pictures, but I hadn't had the chance to view it in person yet. I got there around noon, parking in the driveway. The house was definitely small, but it looked nice from the outside. Evan was standing in the garage, waving me over. He gave me a quick tour, then helped me unload all my stuff into my room. Evan seemed like a regular man in his mid-thirties, which was almost ten years older than myself, but I didn't really mind. He didn't hold conversations very well, and was somewhat shy. Anyway, we finished moving everything inside, and I dropped the U-Haul off. I Ubered back to the house, and by then, it was almost 8 p.m., and I was really tired. Evan was on the couch, watching TV, so I told him I was going to bed early, and I went to my room. All in all, it seemed like a decent place, and I was happy with it. I unpacked some more, then set up my bed, and by 9 o'clock, I was finally ready to sleep. I walked over to my door to lock it and turn off the lights. But as I reached my hand out, I saw the knob on the door was empty. As in, there was no lock on it. Confused, I opened the door. The lock was on the outside of the door. I stepped into the living room and asked Evan why the bedroom door locked from the outside. He looked confused and said he never noticed that but he would switch it around tomorrow. I shrugged and said okay, then went back to my room. I was tired and not too worried about it, but it was definitely an odd find. I got in bed and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up. I heard someone moving around in the kitchen, which I assumed was just Evan getting water or something. I closed my eyes again. A minute later, I heard him walking back down the hallway, but as he was passing my room, he stopped. I opened my eyes and looked at the door. He was standing out there quietly for maybe 15 seconds before I heard a click. He locked my door. My stomach dropped and I felt my face go cold as Evan walked down to his room. As soon as I heard his bedroom door shut, I got up quietly and went over to the door. I tried the handle and it wouldn't budge. I stood in shock for a few seconds, coming to the reality that this man I just met has now locked me in a room. My fear started to turn into anger, and I called out for Evan, telling him to open the door. It only took a second before I heard Evan run out of his room and over to my door. I heard him place his hand on the door, but he paused for a few seconds before he unlocked it. I swung the door open right away. What the hell was that? I confronted him. Evan was stumbling over his words, saying he just wanted to make sure he was safe because he didn't know me well enough. I understood that concern, but locking someone in a room was not a smart way to go about it. I told him that I was going to pack up and leave in the morning. I stayed up all night on the couch in the living room, waiting for the U-Haul store to open at 9 o'clock. 
I looked into the hallway, seeing Evan's bedroom door was still closed, hopefully meaning he was still asleep. Then I drove straight there, and drove the U-Haul back to the house. When I went inside, Evan's bedroom door was open. Evan? I called out. I walked over to his room and peeked my head inside. His room was empty. I moved my eyes around the room in disbelief, seeing as things were only getting weirder. I backed out and got straight to moving my stuff. I powered through two hours of moving boxes and taking apart my bed. I only had two boxes left, and I ran inside and picked up another, then rushed to the front door until Evan appeared in the doorway. Move, I said. He stared at me emotionless. After a few seconds, he stepped aside. I hurried past him and shoved the box in the U-Haul. The last box was half full of random food I kept from my old pantry at the apartment. I decided to just leave it. Evan was freaking me out and I wanted to get away from him as soon as possible. I started closing the back of the U-Haul before Evan interrupted. You forgot this, he held out the last box. Oh yeah, thanks. I grabbed it from him and climbed back into the truck. I felt him watching me as I stacked the box, and when I turned, he had his hand on the door. He started pulling it down, trying to close me in. I was able to stop him before the door was even halfway down. I shoved him to the ground, but he got up and ran. Not into the house, but off into the trees, away from the property. I didn't know what to think, but I didn't care. I quickly shut the back door and drove away. My brother was nice enough to let me stay with him until I found a new place. I don't know what happened at that house, or what would have happened, but there was definitely something very wrong going on. This all happened roughly around four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time I was pretty young. I was single and very keen to have my first experience with someone. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting. We had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him since we had been talking for almost a month. Now even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person. But for some reason, I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions of my life. I invited him to come spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend and I had the place to myself, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around three hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to visit. So he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. The whole time he was driving to my place, I had the sickening sense of impending doom. Almost as if something was going to go very, very wrong. I almost texted him multiple times to tell him that I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jumped up as I heard his car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door. But he pushed his way through, and continued to stare at me blankly, all whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me. I hesitantly went along with it, as this was my first experience with someone. He was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only 5 p.m. But I told him it was fine, and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After about an hour, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around and the sound of him talking. So I made my way upstairs and opened my door, only to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed. He sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes, putting his hands around my neck lightly. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, 
and it worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat. He asked, does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am and what I look like? I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends knew he was here. This was a complete lie because I don't have a sister and my friends were unaware, but something inside of me forced me to say it. After minutes of awkward silence, he stood up to gather his things. I noticed that in his backpack, he had tape, rope, and handcuffs. At first, it didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff, but looking back, I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm going to head home. I have a long drive, and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my door because I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to even look at me or say goodbye. He raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to see if he had left anything because he'd left in a hurry. I found a note on my desk with the words, being nice is what saved you. At the time, I had no idea what the note meant. Now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions toward me. I'm still angry at myself for letting a stranger into my home, which was obviously a big mistake. I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I am just so lucky that I made it out alive. All I know is that he is now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I am glad that he is many miles away from me. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even seven yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up some time later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright, I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footsteps as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank God he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access and the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, 
They ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frey cuffs and work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be placed in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pen, which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get the door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and get motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even practiced doing that at my new place, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. About 10 years ago, I lived on my own and didn't have much company. I was quite depressed at the time after losing my girlfriend to a drunk driver. I was enjoying a beer and watching the sunset on the back porch when I saw a large, scruffy man emerging from the tree line. My heart skipped a beat as he stumbled towards my house in a menacing way. Living alone, I often used my backyard for target practice. And at that moment, I was immensely grateful for it. Instinctively, I rushed to bolt all the doors while frantically dialing the police. What I didn't know was that this intruder had broken in the day before through a basement window and had spent the night squatting there. He had left the basement door unlocked and at this point he'd made his way inside the house and was making his way up the stairs towards me. 
I gripped my rifle, aiming at the approaching man as he descended the hallway. I shouted at him, ordering him to stop and get on the ground, but he just kept walking towards me. I fired the first round, loaded with rock salt, but he showed no reaction. I quickly followed with a rubber bullet to the chest. Yet the drugged up guy who was clearly out of his mind, continued advancing. This guy was huge, at least twice my size, and I realized that whatever drugs he had in his body were going to push him through any pain that a rubber bullet would inflict. He was backing me into a corner. I desperately begged him to stop and warned him what would happen, but he just moaned at me like a zombie and shouted, Shoot! Do it! Then he lunged towards me. I took my third shot. I can't recall whether it was buckshot or a slug, but it left a gaping hole in his chest. It barely even slowed him down. He kept coming, and in a frenzied struggle, he wrestled me to the ground. He was moaning and coughing up blood. Suddenly, he grabbed my face with both of his massive hands and started squeezing my head. It was utterly terrifying. I could feel him trying to burst my skull open like a balloon. I don't know how long it actually lasted, but it felt like forever. Eventually, the injury finally caught up with him, and he died on top of me. I was laying with him crushing me for a few minutes. My energy was completely drained and I could barely breathe with his weight on top of me. His body was pushing my rifle into my chest and it was causing me serious pain when I tilted his body to the side. I was completely drenched in his blood and I can still remember the overwhelming smell. I'd completely forgotten that I was still on the phone with the operator, who had heard our entire exchange, which more or less amounted to me pleading, stop, or I'll shoot, and the man menacingly taunting. The police arrived soon after, and the incident made it to the local papers. There was a criminal investigation, but eventually, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. It turned out that the intruder was wanted for murder of an elderly couple in Baltimore and had somehow made his way 50 miles up the road into our rural area. My roommate was out of the house for the week, so I had the place to myself. It was spring break, so my college classes were out. I had no plans and really nothing I needed to do. On Monday, I was basically trapped inside due to a huge storm blowing through our city. This was common around this time of year, but it still always seemed worse every time. The trees always looked like they were going to blow away, and the house would shake and creak non-stop. Knowing I wouldn't be able to sleep, I decided to just stay up. I turned on the Xbox and started up one of my video games and played for well over an hour, probably until 11 o'clock when the doorbell rang. I paused the game and got up, but then I remembered the whole storm situation. Who would be outside right now? I went over to the front door and looked through the peephole, but nothing. I opened the door. The wind and water hit me right away, but when I looked around, I didn't see anyone. I closed the door and thought maybe the wind had somehow rung the doorbell. I don't know, it sounds dumb now, but what was I supposed to think? I went back to my game, but only a couple minutes later, I heard a huge crash in the backyard, stuff tumbling over and breaking. I immediately knew it was our patio furniture and ran over to the back door. Everything was scattered around the yard, blowing around in the wind. I quickly put on my shoes and went outside, pushing each piece of furniture up against the back of the house. The wind was so heavy it would even hurt sometimes when the water would hit my face. I was rushing, going as fast as I could until I saw someone. They were standing at the edge of the backyard, watching me. I looked back at them for a moment but then grabbed the last piece of furniture and ran inside to escape the rain. I looked at the back door as I dried off but the person was gone. Between that and the doorbell ringing, I was a little bit nervous. I sat in the living room this time, just scrolling on my phone because I was tired of being interrupted. After a while, I struggled to keep my eyes open. 
I got a blanket and laid down on the couch. I didn't feel like going upstairs, and the storm was much louder up there. It took a while, but eventually, I drifted off and fell asleep. A few hours later, still well into the night, I woke up from a sudden burst of heavy wind outside, shaking the house. I pulled the blanket to the side and sat up, moving my feet to the floor as I prepared to go check if the furniture outside was still there. But just when my feet touched the floor, they were soaked. It woke me up immediately. I looked down and saw a puddle on the ground right next to the couch. Then I saw another, leading in a line across the floor. Inside the puddles were faint muddy shoe prints. I stood up and ran to the corner of the room, heart beating rapidly in my chest. After a minute of hearing nothing but the wind outside, I slowly followed the shoe prints. They led all throughout the house, upstairs and down, but I could clearly tell that they entered through the back door, which I had stupidly forgotten to lock in the rush of getting out of the rain. I locked it and pulled my phone out to call 911, but then the thought crept into my mind, what if they're still inside? I stayed quiet and moved into the corner of the house where I felt the most hidden. I waited in silence for them to arrive. When they did, they took a look around, seeing everything I saw, but nothing more. They told me it seems like a personal attack because nothing was missing and they were clearly focused on my house in particular. However, they walked right up to me while I was sleeping and seemingly did nothing but watch me, which is super creepy but doesn't make much sense. If they wanted to do something to me, they would have done it at that moment. After some thought, this had led me to believe that whoever it was had actually come from my roommates. They saw me, then looked around the whole house, and then left doing absolutely nothing. So if this was a personal attack and my roommate was there, I think things may have gone a lot worse than they had. I'm a wilderness survival instructor and security contractor. A couple of days ago, a good friend of mine, who is also one of my students, informed me that his dad just acquired 150 acres of land in a secluded and mountainous part of my state. This is someone with whom I've explored the woods before. He's more than competent when it comes to wilderness survival. The property, largely unexplored except for a hundred yards that his dad had used for his horses, who were currently roaming freely, seemed intriguing. According to my friend, his dad got an incredible deal on the land. Given my friend, now a father of three, doesn't get out into the woods often, I agreed to join him for what seemed like a fun outing and much needed break. We share interests in our indigenous roots, cars, wilderness survival, and various other activities, ensuring lively conversations while in the woods. However, his dad cautioned us against exploring the woods without a gun, citing the presence of coyotes. But being natives of this area, we know coyotes rarely pose a threat to people. Additionally, my friend, whom we call DJ, previously mentioned seeing human-sized movement in the tree lines during his earlier visits to the property. Yet, Due to his poor eyesight, he couldn't confirm what he had seen. For our exploration, I brought along my AR and a small flint napping kit, mainly for amusement. And off we went onto the property. Initially, we hiked across fields and creeks, multiple natural springs, and ponds, everything appearing normal and showcasing a beautiful landscape. But as we ventured into the unexplored forested section, the atmosphere changed dramatically. The forest exuded an eerie ambience reminiscent of the woods in the movie The Ritual. Gray and ominously quiet, except for the occasional creaking of the tall cedar trees. It felt like we were being observed from every angle. The air carried a putrid stench, akin to rotting flesh. Intrigued, we followed the smell and stumbled upon the remains of three to four cows. I took a video of them to show them to anyone who might know what could have done this. Examining the exposed skulls revealed no evidence of bullet wounds. Something had killed them, scattering their bones over a 30-yard area. Large and vague footprints surrounded the remains. Pressing deeper into the woods, accompanied only by silence, the smell of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats, we noticed various tracks along the stream. There were large coyote prints and something else, also large, intentionally avoiding the sand. Continuing, we encountered trees bent over and pinned behind others while still alive. 
an occurrence impossible in nature. Further along, we discovered what resembled a primitive tool made of bone, possibly a scooping tool or knife. It disturbed us because although rudimentary, it appeared more primitive than anything a human would make, yet clearly shaped intentionally. Our hike led us to a clearing with a pond encircled by large circular tracks. On the opposite side of the pond stood a peculiar little tree structure, an A-frame with rocks propped against it. However, it lacked stability, and the arrangement of rocks seemed oddly deliberate. Notably, there were no signs of campfires or camping debris nearby. This wasn't a location easily accessible from a house. I extensively photographed and filmed this strange hut-like structure. As dusk approached, we decided it was time to head back. I had a flashlight attached to my AR, but relying on that in the dark, when there's something out there capable of killing cows and making tools out of their bones, didn't seem wise. We retraced our steps out of the forest, reaching our trucks just before it became too dark. While leaving, we noticed an unidentified figure atop one of the hills, but chose not to investigate further. It's worth mentioning that the previous owner commenced construction on the property, abruptly stopped, and vacated the premises. We're planning on going back there again this weekend, but this time with a few more people and all of our camping gear. I grew up in these woods and usually feel comfortable there. However, I stumbled into a few unsettling situations that would stick in my mind forever. This was one such occasion. I was 18 at the time. One evening, my two friends, Mike and Paul, and I decided to go camping. Well, camping might not be the right word since we didn't plan to spend the night, just chill and have some fun around the campfire for a while. The plan was simple, head out, build a campfire, drink a few bottles of wine, eat something, and head back home for a good night's sleep. We met at my house while it was still sunny outside, got ready, and headed out. Our destination was an old abandoned quarry in the middle of the woods, about 40 minutes from my house. Even though the quarry had a tragic and frankly creepy history, it was a popular place for such occasions. When we got there, the sky was already reddish as the sun slowly sank behind the hills. We quickly gathered all the firewood we could find so we wouldn't have to look for it later. As darkness fell and everything around us turned into impenetrable blackness, we managed to get the fire going. We were in a great mood and were getting ready for our first toast. That's when we realized we made a horrible mistake. We forgot the corkscrew. We attempted to open the wine without it, but quickly gave up. The bottles were quite expensive and we didn't want to damage them. At this point, it was clear that one of us would have to jog back to retrieve the corkscrew. After some discussion, I volunteered with two conditions. Firstly, they would give me a hatchet in case something went wrong along the way. Secondly, and no pranks when I got back. Mike and Paul agreed without hesitation. They handed me a hatchet and a flashlight and sent me on my way. As I jogged through the forest, I heard a noise resembling a boar. Suddenly, I remembered a warning I received from an older hunter a few days ago. He said that at this time of year, boars were getting dangerous, especially at night. I was a bit nervous, but luckily managed to survive unharmed. I arrived safely back home, much to the surprise of my mom, who didn't expect me so early. I explained the situation, she just laughed, I grabbed the corkscrew, and headed back. Not wanting to encounter a boar, I chose another slightly longer path, this time through an open field. After a while, I reached our spot. It was a small clearing surrounded on one side by massive rocks, maybe 70 meters tall, and on the other side by a thick forest. Our campfire was in the middle of the clearing. When I approached it, I realized that there wasn't anybody around, although our backpacks were still on the ground, and the fire was burning brightly. Great. We specifically agreed that there would be no pranks when I got back. Those guys think they're funny, I thought to myself. I resignedly sat down near the fire facing the woods. That's the only place where they could have hidden, 
I thought. I was really tired, and all I could think about was the taste of the exquisite pinot that we brought with us. I wasn't in the mood for their games, and I was getting quite mad. That's when I heard the snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves from the edge of the forest, maybe thirty meters from where I was sitting. The sound was rhythmic and undoubtedly the sound of somebody walking. I aimed my flashlight in that direction and spotted a tall person wearing a dark hoodie. As I shined my flashlight on him, he stopped walking, turned towards me, and just kept staring motionlessly. Even though he was facing me directly, I couldn't see his face. I shouted, Paul, you fat jerk. I know you're trying to scare me. We agreed on something, so stop messing around and come out. As I finished, the hooded figure turned and walked deeper into the woods. At that moment, my phone started ringing. I hurriedly took it out of my pocket. It was Mike. I took the call and started barking at him, really funny you guys. I thought we agreed on something. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you trying to mess with me. I clearly saw you, so you can come out. Mike seemed frozen for a minute. For what felt like an eternity, all I could hear was his heavy breathing and Paul mumbling something in the background. When he finally snapped back to reality, he said, Dude, we're at your house. We heard some footsteps. At first, we thought it was you messing with us. But then we got scared and decided to look for you. I forgot my phone at your house, so we couldn't even call you. Just get out of there, and we'll come back for our stuff together. Nonsense. That's just another of your stupid pranks, and I'm not buying it. Hold on a second. There was some incoherent mumbling for a while. Hey. What's going on? My mom's voice suddenly came from the phone. My head spun, and my heart skipped a beat as I realized they weren't kidding. Suddenly, a wave of fear ran through my body. However, I managed to convince my mom that everything was fine and that she shouldn't worry. She gave the phone back to Mike. Just leave everything and come back. We're heading over right now. We'll meet you halfway there. I'm not going anywhere alone again. You better get here quick. I'm waiting for you. I hung up. I didn't want to make any more noise than I already did. I quickly turned off my flashlight and backed off from the light of the fire. I moved all the way to the huge wall of rocks, figuring that if I had my back covered, it would eliminate one possible approach for the unwanted visitor. I stood there in complete darkness, trying not to make a sound while tightly clutching my hatchet, which would be my best friend for the next half an hour. I had to convince myself not to curl into a ball in fear. Even my own body started to betray me as my hearing worsened due to my wildly beating heart. I tried to calm myself, but in the worst case scenario, every bit of adrenaline would help. After what seemed like an eternity, I spotted two weak light beams coming from the forest. I heard Paul shout my name. I'd never been so relieved. I finally ran out of my hiding spot to greet my friends. For quite some time, we just stood there, laughing from relief. We even got a bit cocky and considered staying. After all, there was just one, supposedly, creep lurking between the trees, and there were three of us. Funny. Minutes earlier, I was terrified, and suddenly I was full of tough bravado, thinking, what could possibly happen? In the end, good judgment prevailed, and we decided to leave. We packed our things, extinguished the fire, and left. We took our wine bottles to enjoy somewhere else. Somewhere well lit and safe. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. My first assignment has been in the Potomac District of the Monongahela National Forest. Basically, I receive GPS coordinates and I either drive or hike to the designated spot and do what they want. This could be setting up trail cameras or counters, monitoring equipment, trail surveys and the like and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. 
I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but some are way off the trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes, there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough, these are the remote mountains in West Virginia, and the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dang camping gear on the occasions I might have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I am a woman, about 5 feet 6 inches and 130 pounds, but not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So I have been assigned to this district for a few months now and have really enjoyed my work. West Virginia is very remote and unspoiled and that's why I enjoy my work. I get to see things most people would never see in their lives and I have had so many positive and almost spiritual moments up until a few nights ago. I was working up near Spruce Knob, which is the highest point in West Virginia. It's essentially a complex system of trails, wilderness areas, camping, that kind of thing. It has also been snowing with howling winds and ice storms. I was camping up there to complete my work and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp and drank some whiskey and smoked some really good bud. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold but I wore this turtle fur face mask thing and didn't feel the cold too much. I woke up at dawn and went about building my fire back up and I was starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone or something had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras and didn't have time to really wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear headphones or anything like that, because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals, people, etc. before I see them. It was already past dark when I made it back to camp and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get in my sleeping bag and pass out. Around 2 a.m., I woke up because I could hear people talking. People. I was about 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and about 10 miles from where my truck was parked and I could hear voices. I completely lost it. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back in my sleeping bag and cocked it and waited. I was on high alert, all my senses going wild. Eventually the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore but I never went back to sleep. At daylight, I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree about 5 feet from my tent. These were cameras that I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my stuff as fast as I could and practically ran back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of footprints all around my site and when I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into and my computer and other equipment had been stolen. I am currently in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment and too embarrassed to tell my superiors how scared I am. The Forest Service brought me a new truck while my other one is getting the window replaced and I did make a report about the theft but there is absolutely no way that I am ever going back to that site. I don't know if this means I will be fired or sent to work a desk, but out of all the years I have been doing this in national forests around the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. I am not scared of the animals and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them. I am scared of the people. I've held this story in for the last six years because it sounds crazy and I got told not to talk about it. I went camping six years ago with a now ex-boyfriend. The campsite we picked was beautiful. We were able to drive in through some rough trails. The spot we picked was next to some hiking trails that weren't very far from some natural hot springs and a huge waterfall. We were in the middle of nowhere, absolutely no one was around. 
We set up camp next to the car, went hiking, soaked in the hot springs, came back, and had dinner. It was all very normal. Until we woke up the next day. I need to give some context as to how we slept that night so you can understand my confusion. Before we went to sleep, I put our food cooler in a stereo that we brought in the car and locked it. I put the keys in the front pocket of my backpack and placed the backpack next to my sleeping bag on the far side of the tent, away from the door of the tent. My boyfriend at the time slept nearest the door of the tent with a gun next to him. When we woke up the next morning, I felt fine. I had slept hard, and from inside the tent, everything seemed normal. When we got out, our campsite was absolute chaos. The fire pit we had made was ruined. The cooler had been thrown, and food was scattered all over the place. The stereo was smashed to pieces, lying next to a tree. All of the car doors were open, including the trunk. We stood there for a minute in silence, just taking everything in. The woods felt strange, it was quiet and not the beautiful campsite that I saw yesterday. Everything about those woods felt wrong. My ex accused me of not locking the car and said that an animal got into our stuff. I promised that I had locked it and went into the tent to grab the keys from my backpack, but they weren't there. I found them later on the ground right next to the car. We quickly threw everything in the trunk and left. My boyfriend was quiet and wouldn't talk to me about what had just happened. He finally spoke up when we were almost home and told me that he had a dream about something kneeling over him in the tent, holding his gun, and just staring at him. When I tried to ask him more questions, he got quiet again and said he didn't want to talk about it and that I shouldn't talk about it anymore either. I've tried to forget about it, but I just can't. Something really wrong happened to us in the woods that night. This happened about 10 years ago, in August 2013. I was camping in far north Queensland, Australia, in a place called Barron Falls. I'm a 21-year-old girl, and I was camping with my two male friends who were backpacking from Estonia, Theo and Charlie. Where we set up camp was not an official campsite. Instead, we walked along the tourist path, climbed over a railing, followed a train track for a few kilometers, and eventually veered off into the dense forest, downhill to the river. It certainly wasn't easy to get to this area, and there wasn't any mobile phone service, but Theo knew about it from friends who had shown it to him previously. The sight was beautiful. We were surrounded by a tropical forest and were only a short walk upstream from the waterfall. After setting up camp, we walked to the waterfall where both Theo and Charlie plunged from the cliff into the water below. I decided not to follow. I was, and still am, scared of heights and the possibility of hurting myself. I sat and watched them for a while before eventually deciding to return to camp and read my book. I was totally relaxed, enjoying the serenity, taking in the beauty around me. What had been an exciting adventurous day was then interrupted by a deep sinister laughter coming from the forest surrounding our campsite. Instantly alerted, I felt chills run through my body as I scanned the forest trying to detect where the laughter had come from. There was nothing. I tried to forget about it, convincing myself that my mind was playing tricks on me. Theo and Charlie returned and told me that they had forgotten fire lighters for the campfire. They said that they need to travel to the nearest store to buy some and that I should wait at camp. I told them that I didn't feel comfortable staying at camp but didn't mention the laughter I heard before. I didn't want them to think I was stupid and for context, at the time I had quite a large crush on Charlie. Stupidly, I wanted him to think I was cool. They told me it would be fine that they would be back before dark. Reluctantly, I agreed and they made their way to the store. It was about 4 p.m., and I continued reading my book. I began to think about it, and I realized that the walk back to the car was about 20 to 30 minutes, so they would be gone for well over an hour. At this time of year, dusk would be at 5.30 p.m. or so, and I would therefore likely be alone in this remote area in the dark. I distracted myself with my book, but as dusk began to settle, 
I struggled to read the pages, and fear began to set in. After about an hour, I started to hear footsteps in the forest. My first thought was that Theo and Charlie had returned, and I was instantly relieved that I was no longer alone. I listened for their voices, but heard nothing. My heart dropped. It dawned on me that it may be someone else, and I started panicking. Then came the laughter. The same deep sinister laughter I heard before, only this time, it seemed much closer. I sprung to my feet and surveyed the forest. That's when I saw him. He was standing on the other side of a stream, which was connected to the river. Standing on a log, what I saw was absolutely bizarre. He was wearing an immaculate tuxedo, with a top hat and all. I remember being puzzled as to how he was able to get to this area in such clean formal clothes, and I at first thought he may be an apparition or that I was hallucinating. I did a double take, and I was not. I then studied the man's face. It is hard to describe, but it looked like his face was burnt, like Dwight from The Walking Dead, and he had deep scarring covering his face. His hair was shoulder length, very wiry, and unkempt. He laughed, that same laugh I heard from the forest. Miraculously, I heard my friend's voices approaching. The man seemed alarmed, and said that he saw somebody else camping upstream, and that he is going to check on them. He left, and minutes later, Theo and Charlie returned. I immediately told them what happened, and they laughed and thought I was making it up, that it was a lame attempt to scare them. Tears began to gather in my eyes, and Charlie realized that I was serious. Theo didn't seem phased. He was a very stereotypical backpacker and had the carefree nature travelers tend to have. Charlie, however, assured me that I would be okay and had me sleep between him and Theo for the next two nights. I barely slept at all for those nights. I kept listening for the laughter, but fortunately never heard it again. For years after, I searched online for any reports of similar encounters. I never found anything, but I have always contemplated what would have happened if Theo and Charlie hadn't returned at that moment. I shudder at the thought. This happened about 20 years ago, and I don't think I will ever forget it. Back in those days, I was an apprentice hairdresser for one of the top five ranked stylists in Japan. Training in that profession at that level was very strict, and beauty standards were a bit different. You probably don't need me telling you that, but it's probably worth keeping in mind. Back to training, it was long, and the time off between sessions was pretty much non-existent. We were expected to be at training even during national holidays. I'm not sure if that was strictly by the books, but as impressionable young stylists, we couldn't be seen refusing training. I think I had about three or four days off for summer. I took them all at once, and a lot of my friends and co-workers used the time to head back to their hometowns and see families. Since I lived really close to where I was studying, I didn't want to use my time off just hanging around at home, I could do that any time. So, I accepted an offer from one of my seniors to visit his hometown. It was really late by the time I finished work, and we managed to get to my senior's hometown at around 2 a.m. The satellite navigation system told me that we were about 15 minutes away from arrival. The roads were dark and empty. We were the only ones on the road that late. He lived in the middle of nowhere, so that could have been a reason. I remember seeing empty fields on either side of the road. I kind of regretted coming already. I mean, what the hell were we going to do here? He should have probably mentioned that he lived in the rural countryside. I just watched the road and tried to stay awake. I should say that I was driving. I felt like driving since I didn't get to drive much. I might have changed my mind if I had known it was going to be that far to get to his family home. Then suddenly, something appeared out of the darkness in front of the car. A woman with no clothes came running down the opposite lane of the road towards us. I slammed on the brakes because I thought that I just witnessed the paranormal. She ran past us. I looked in the rearview mirror to see a woman between the ages of about 18 to 20 years old. She kept running, then she turned around and ran towards our car. I looked at my friend, and he had a look of disbelief on his face, and I guessed that I didn't have that much of a different look. 
I think the reality of the situation was we both didn't know what to do. I said to him, is that a ghost? I don't know, shall we just keep going, he replied. We slowly pulled away. I was very skeptical because I thought she looked so real. I made sure I kept to a low speed, and I kept checking the mirrors. The woman got closer, and I stopped the car and said to him, that's not a ghost, come on, we have to stop and see if she's okay. He agreed and said he would call out to her. It was so creepy to see someone running around in the middle of nowhere, even creepier if you haven't been to that place before. She kept on running past our car, so I tried to match her speed as my friend rolled down the window and tried to speak to her. Hey, you shouldn't be running around on the roads like that, this late at night, maybe you should head home, he said something like that. It wasn't very well put together or that sympathetic, I remember that much. She didn't even turn to face the car, she just said, hey, don't worry, I'm fine. It feels so good. I could see her a little closer now and guessed her age to be around 18 or 19 years old. Why are you like this? Have you been kidnapped? Has someone done something to you? It's really dangerous to be out here with no clothes and alone, we have to get you home, I said to her. She stopped running and looked down at the floor as if in thought, and then replied, I ran away from home. I don't even know where home is. I noticed at that point that she was actually wearing socks and shoes so at least her feet weren't too bad. She stood there with her hands behind her back, looking completely lost and confused. It was very odd. I couldn't leave her out here. I told my friend in a hushed voice that we had to help her, and he sighed but then nodded. We decided to take her to the nearest police station. I had a dress that belonged to one of my female colleagues at work in the back of my car. Long story short, I told the woman to throw it on and she reluctantly agreed. Once she was dressed and in the back seat, I turned to her and said, right, if you can't remember where home is, I can take you to the police, and we can figure it out from there, okay? To that, she responded with something outrageous. I hate the police, they're always on my dad's side. Please, can you just take me to a hotel? Hotels are safer than police for sure. You can stay there with me. Hold me tonight, I'm a virgin. We were young, but even though we were young and often threw caution to the wind, we knew that we had to get her somewhere safe. It's a scary world out there. If she said that to another pair of guys like us in the next car that came along, well, I don't even want to think about it. We told her that wasn't going to happen. She didn't say anything for a while, but then she handed me a piece of paper. I don't know where she got it from, but it had a name, a number, and the address of a hospital. My friend saw the address and said, Oh, I know that place. It was a psychiatric hospital. We called the number, and a voice that said it was the security department answered. I explained to the security guard what happened, and after we hung up, we got a call from the woman's mother. We found out where her mom lived and took her there. My friend said that he knew that side of town, but he had never been there before. The woman's mother was extremely apologetic over the phone. My friend spoke to her, and he said that he could tell that she was definitely genuine and sorry for the inconvenience. I felt sorry for her, it wasn't her fault. When we got to the house, we heard more about the situation from her mother. The woman we found out in the middle of nowhere had only just turned 18. She had been assaulted by her biological father when she was 16. A few days after he did what he did, she stabbed him in the neck with a box cutter knife. She was admitted to a mental asylum because of this attack. No one seems to know how she keeps getting out but the mother said to us that this was the third time she'd successfully broken free. What a sensational story, I remember thinking. We drove the mother and daughter to the hospital at the mother's request. I could see how mentally tired she was by all of what had been going on. She was so polite and grateful, she really impressed me. I mean, with all that happened, she seemed to be incredibly in control of her own emotions. The girl didn't seem to say much, she seemed to like the dress we gave her. The mother apologized for not washing it before returning it, 
and we both agreed that no apology was necessary. Obviously, she got dressed into clothes of her own. She disappeared upstairs to change and then she came back, and we took off. She didn't say much when we were driving, she was taking being returned to the asylum a lot better than expected. I thought that she would be going kicking and screaming. Her mother spoke with her in the back as we drove. She said, you didn't get injured or anything when you were out, did you? No, I'm fine, the daughter responded. Oh, that's great, I'm relieved, the mother told her. We left them at the hospital and told them that we couldn't stay because we were already really late getting to my friend's parents' home. My friend's parents were really worried by the time we got there. I think that we both wanted to tell them everything about the situation, but we were too tired to go through it all again. At that point, I just wanted to go to sleep. I stayed with him and his family for three days. It was actually a really great time and just what I needed, a break from studies in the city. It was certainly going to be a trip I would never forget. We said our goodbyes to the family, and his little sister asked us for a ride to the station. I said that it wouldn't be a problem. Just before we dropped her off at the station, she said something that scared the hell out of me. Hey big bro, why does your friend have a box cutter stabbed in the back seat? So, a quick backstory, I used to live in a very small town, predominantly safe for kids, with only some drug issues. My house was located in a small upscale part of the town, most people who lived there were families. A small pond with lots of greenery in the neighborhood was about a five minute walk from my house. To get to the pond, you had to go down a grass hill. Neighborhood kids, including myself, would always go down to the pond for hours to catch frogs, skip rocks, and enjoy nature. Now, on to the story. On this particular day, it was rainy and pretty cold, so there were no other kids at the pond. My best friend, her brother, who was one year older than us, and myself, decided to head down to the pond for a bit. After about half an hour, we saw a minivan pull up at the top of the hill. We thought nothing of it, assuming it was probably someone stopping at the neighborhood mailbox. A man, probably in his 60s, got out. In our small town, everyone knew everyone, or at least recognized each other. I found it strange that I had never seen this man before in town or the neighborhood. He just stared at the three of us for what seemed like forever. Suddenly, he yelled at us, saying, It's not safe down there, you kids better come up here. My best friend and her brother looked terrified, and I had this gut feeling that something wasn't right. We didn't respond, but he kept repeating that phrase. It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. Our fight or flight reaction kicked in, and we all sprinted up the other side of the hill, just a few meters away from him and the minivan. As soon as he saw us running, he got into his minivan and started driving slowly behind us, literally following us until we reached my house. Fortunately, my garage door was open and my parents' cars were parked inside. We hid behind one of my parents' cars and watched as he pulled to the side of my house and parked. My parents were inside, unaware of what was happening. He stayed parked in front of my house for a couple of minutes until my dad came outside to take out the trash and saw the three of us hiding. I guess the man saw my dad and drove away, but as soon as he left, we told my parents everything. Even now, 12 years later, my parents still think we were being overdramatic and that the man was genuinely concerned for our safety because of the weather. Nonetheless, we weren't allowed to go back to the pond anymore. I understand why they think this, the three of us tended to exaggerate things and be dramatic. However, I knew from the strange feeling I had when I first saw him at the top of the hill that something was off. To this day, I still believe he was planning something, but maybe it was just my childish imagination. I used to work in a hole-in-the-wall gas station out in the sticks of North Carolina. I was freshly 18, had a new car, a run-down Chevy, but it got me from point A to point B, 
and was newly promoted to assistant manager, so I was working many late nights by myself. Truthfully, I loved working alone. My boss was super laid back, and his philosophy was, as long as the work gets done, do whatever you please. We even had a shotgun behind the counter, which he taught me to shoot on my first day there. So even though I would be there late, I always felt safe. On this particular night, it was extremely dead, so with my boss's permission, I closed the store early and hopped in my car. It was probably 11.30 to 12 a.m. at this point. Other than being able to get out of work early, this was my usual routine. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I texted my roommate to let her know I was getting home early. We always looked out for each other like that, lit up a cigarette, and then started on my way home. For those of you who don't know North Carolina very well, I'm going to provide a little bit of detail regarding the terrain. From where I worked at the gas station to where I lived, I had to drive down the back roads. These roads consisted of very dense woods on both sides. Sometimes, the woods would seem so thick that you really couldn't tell where you were. Especially at night. This could be intimidating to those who don't know the area, but honestly, I was more worried about deer jumping out in front of me, which was a common occurrence in this area. I'm driving down the road, blaring Nirvana, my favorite band at the time, and just being a typical 18-year-old grunge kid who had newly discovered the freedom of being an adult and getting off work. When all of a sudden, I see something in the middle of the road, probably 75 to 100 feet ahead. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it looked too small. So I started to gradually slow down, ultimately coming to a stop. I have to wear glasses when I drive. I mainly need them at night, but my eyesight isn't terrible enough for me to make it a habit. I grab my glasses and put them on. Now being able to see much more clearly, I almost shat myself at what I saw. It was a woman. An older woman, wearing what looked like a nightgown of some kind. Her hair was in disarray, she had her hands behind her back, and she was just standing there, in the middle of the road, just staring at me in my car. Let me remind you, we are practically in the middle of nowhere. There are trees as far as my headlights can shine, and it's midnight. I'm naturally paranoid, so all sorts of questions were running through my head. Who is this woman? Where did she come from? It's midnight. Are my doors locked? Why is she out here at midnight? Should I honk my horn at her? Should I call the police? What if she has Alzheimer's and doesn't know where she is? Or what if she's an escape patient? Even though the closest mental facility was three to four cities away, I didn't exclude that possibility. I thought about calling the cops, but I got my phone and of course, there was no cell service. This encounter went on for a while, just sitting in the middle of the road, mentally questioning what was happening. It's now way past midnight, she's still standing there, just staring at me with this zoned out look, hands behind her back as if she's observing me. I'm starting to get tired of this, considering that I had to be up early for work the next morning. So I honked my horn at her. I didn't expect what happened next. This woman's face turns from being spaced out to complete rage. And she raised her arms up. It looked like she was holding something in her hand. She lets out this horrid animalistic scream and charges at my car. As she ran closer, I realized she was holding something sharp. It looked like a kitchen knife or a piece of jagged glass. During this moment of horror, I had a brief flashback to my stepdad giving me advice when I first got my license. If an animal ever runs out in front of you, turn it into a speed bump. I love animals, so I couldn't bear to hear that. But this time, I was taking my stepdad's advice. I was going to turn this psycho into a speed bump. Surf the Servants, by Nirvana, started playing on the radio. I mention this because the song has much to do with the aura of the moment. As if it was in sync with this instance in time, the intensity of the song enabled me to let out the most intimidating primal scream that I could. Loud enough for her to hear it. The window was open because I had been smoking, and I hit the gas. She was running towards my car like she was going to jump on my hood. 
I guess she realized I had the utmost intent to hit her, in which at this point, the woman zigzags away from my car and runs off into the woods. Still in fight mode, I didn't question where this woman went. I was just glad that she was gone, so I accelerated on the gas and sped the entire way home. I got home at almost 1.30 a.m. My roommate was still awake, waiting up for me the entire time. She was extremely worried because it was way past the time I said I was going to be home. She had been texting and calling me when I pulled up to her house. I got all of her texts and missed calls at once, so I started to explain to her what happened. My body went from fight mode to panic as I was recounting everything that happened. My roommate's mother was a 911 operator who also happened to be working that night. So she decided to text her mom to see if there were any silver alerts in the area. Immediately, her mom texted back and said there wasn't. That alone gave me goosebumps to the core of my being. There was no explanation as to where this lady came from. I used to work in a residential care facility, and for a number of years, I worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to work with, but she could be intense. The sort of joking flotation that often found its way into high-pressure environments was common throughout the whole team, but when she directed it at me, it didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize, because I usually didn't notice someone flirting with me until someone else pointed it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally started to pick up on it. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around on my shift hours after hers had finished, unwanted touching, etc. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible. I stopped answering calls and texts, locked down social media, spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but looking back, it was all kinds of messed up. She even parked outside my house sometimes, and I'd sit in the back room with the light off so she'd think I wasn't home. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed right off. I was pleased. We all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Yeah, not quite. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attentions on another co-worker Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friend, but didn't know each other well. I didn't think much other than good luck, you poor sucker. A few months later again, and I got a call out of the blue from a mutual friend. Without preamble, he asked, were you dating Kajiri? Um, no, I don't swing that way. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri and had helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda and she asked about my relationship with Kajiri. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual sensible grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda, posing as Linda. In a string of emails, fake Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem, her abusive and dangerous ex, none other than yours truly. There was a story about fake Linda coming out to her family after her brother caught her in bed with Kajiri, and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband, who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend which was a complete shock to Linda when she learned about herself that she was no longer a straight woman and had a girlfriend. So essentially, Kajiri moved on from me, found a new target, started emailing Amanda from a fake account, pretending to be Linda. She told all these stories about being with Kajiri, about how I was an abusive ex, and how Linda was caught by her family being with a woman and all the drama that it caused. She made up a bunch of insane stories to justify her creepy obsessive fantasies and was telling them to Amanda and other people from a fake email to make it sound like the stories were from the fake girlfriend and Kajiri couldn't be accused of making it up. 
Here's some highlights of the stories Kajiri had been telling to Linda, her friends, and other co-workers I wasn't close to, she picked her audience very carefully. That Linda and I had physically fought at work over Kajiri. That I had an orgy in the staff office on a night shift with Kajiri and two male co-workers. That Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker, not one of the orgy ones, I was really getting around apparently. That I would drug her against her will. That we had planned to have children using a sperm donor, but that I couldn't decide who would have the baby. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera and using her co-workers and friends as characters. Linda and I reported her to management and she was immediately suspended, pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I had an orgy at work. Because that was totally plausible and not at all made up by a crazy woman. They put me through hell investigating this imaginary story about me and two men and another woman. Even though the only men in our department are twice my age and happily married. It made me never want to trust HR again. I left that job a month later myself, and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half an hour before me. And they were looking to hire two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been two other openings since, and she applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she has a history of inpatient psych treatment for delusional behavior and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Facebook, her current girlfriend has a similar first name as me and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live. So I'm pretty sure that the current situation is that she's still telling people that I'm her girlfriend, all while she's desperately applying for any job she can get at my new workplace. Okay, so I wasn't conventionally, nor classically pretty. I was the duff in any friend group I found myself in. I never worried about being hit on, disrespected, or kidnapped. Safety concerns were never an issue for me when going out because I was never the one anyone wanted to get to know or be around, I was just too plain. It was always me who had to look out for my friends, male and female alike. I used to go to a local bar almost daily. I didn't drink alcohol there, I just ordered a regular coke and waited for my ride home. It was my usual hangout spot after work, so I sat, chilled, and minded my own business. A few weeks ago, I had just finished work and was sitting in my regular spot, sipping my drink while working on a new pendant I was making. I had started wire wrapping crystals into jewelry. I didn't expect anyone to strike up a conversation with me knowing I basically blended into the walls, despite the staff knowing me and paying me slight attention and being nice to me. But this weird guy I'd never seen before came over and sat at my table across from me. I was surprised and engaged in a small conversation that I can't even remember how I started, but he began asking me a few questions about myself that seemed normal and flowed together, so I didn't think much of it. Again, being plain, I didn't think anyone would take interest in me. By then, I had drunk three glasses of soda and needed to use the restroom, so I grabbed my phone and purse and went. When I returned a few minutes later, I resumed working since none of my stuff had been touched. I called a waitress over, asked for a new drink, and she nodded. It had always been engraved in me that you never leave your drink unattended. If you do, either have it remade or leave it to the bartender. As the waitress was reaching for my old drink, which only had a few sips taken out of it, the guy got a bit agitated, saying I was being wasteful for ordering a new drink. I looked at him, eyebrows raised in confusion, and asked why it was his concern. It was my money after all, and refills were free. He then accused me of making more work for the waitress for no reason. Annoyed, I told him firmly that it was my business and if he didn't like it, he could leave. He attempted to wave off the waitress changing my drink, but I had enough of his nonsense and flatly said, you drink it, if you think it's such a waste. It seemed to catch him off guard. He looked shocked, then a bit angry, before storming off. I then handed the drink to the waitress, expressing unease about the guy I was talking to, 
and asked her to inform the bartender to keep an eye on him. I requested to have my drink dumped out and only water served from then on. I left for home after being picked up shortly after, and the next day after work, I found out he had been arrested for assault. I only found out today what exactly had happened. Apparently, he had gotten into a fight with the bartender working that night. The bartender caught him tampering with the girl's drink while she wasn't looking and prevented her from drinking it. The guy got angry, leading to a physical altercation. The cops were called, and now he's awaiting trial. It turns out he was trying to see if he could take advantage of someone like me, someone who always let her guard down due to low confidence. He thought I'd be an easy target with just a little attention. When I didn't consume my drink upon returning, he targeted another girl. If he truly was targeting me, I had to question his sanity and sobriety. I've been with my wife Rebecca for six years and married for 11 months. Our entire history together has been very normal and never once have I noticed any weird behaviors or red flags. I can't stress enough how out of character this whole thing has been. She doesn't even like watching horror movies. When we first started dating she agreed to watch The Shining with me because she knew how much I loved horror. She was so scared that she didn't even make it through half of the movie before we had to turn it off. She isn't into anything creepy and has never been into pranks and that's fine. But that's what was so strange about this. It's just so unlike her. I should also add that she never had any mental health issues and as far as I'm aware it doesn't run in her family. I know some people are able to hide their mental health problems, but in the six years we've been together I think I have seen some sort of sign. Two months ago, I was in the kitchen making myself some coffee. I was running a bit late that morning and knew I wouldn't be able to grab some food on the way to work. I took a sip of my coffee as I hurried down the hall towards the front door when I happened to notice Rebecca peeking at me from around the corner ahead of me. I could only see her eyes and a strand of her long dark hair hanging against the wall. The rest of her body was concealed behind the corner. I nearly spilled my coffee when I saw her. What the hell Rebecca? I said wiping a few drops of coffee from my pants. You scared the hell out of me. She immediately popped out of view like a little kid that had been caught. I heard her scurry off towards the living room and by the time I got to the front door she was out of sight. It was really weird and just totally out of character for her like I said. But I also found it kind of funny that she was being more playful and a little less serious. I shouted that I loved her and called her crazy. As I shut the door behind me I heard her laughing. Her behavior was a bit odd but it certainly wasn't something to call a priest over. I forgot about it by lunch and by the time I got home she was her usual self. I didn't bring it up and life went on. The next incident happened three days later. It was around 2 a.m. and I had woken up to get a drink. I was standing at the kitchen island, glass of orange juice in my hand, when I felt a strong feeling that I was being watched. For whatever reason I looked down at the floor and saw my wife's smiling face staring back. She was peeking at me from the other side of the island, staring up at me with wide unblinking eyes, and grinning. Grinning like the Cheshire Cat. I screamed, I'll admit it. Not out of irritation, but fear. For some reason at that moment I was scared. At the sound of my scream she scurried backwards out of my view, her hands and feet smacking the tile floor as she hurried out of the kitchen on all fours. I didn't run after her, or even shout. I just stood there frozen in shock, wondering what the hell had possessed her to do that. It took me a little longer than I'd like to admit to go back upstairs, but I eventually did. When I got to our bedroom, Rebecca was lying on her side asleep. Or at least pretending to. I stood there for a while, watching her breathing, to be sure she really was asleep. I had the feeling she might jump out at me the moment I got into bed. I climbed in, and she didn't even move. Her breathing was soft and I was starting to wonder if I dreamt the whole thing. The next morning I waited for her to come down for coffee and after handing her a mug and kissing her cheek I decided to ask her about it. What was that about last night? 
I was keeping my tone light so I didn't offend or embarrass her. She frowned over her cup of coffee, shaking her head like she had no clue what I was referring to. You were peeking at me again. From over there. I said, pointing to the spot on the floor by the kitchen island. She followed my gaze, and when she looked back at me she burst out laughing. She laughed so hard that I couldn't help joining in. You creep me out sometimes, you know that? She laughed at what I had said and wrapped her arms around my neck. You creep me out all the time, so I guess we're even. We said our goodbyes and left for work. As I drove I kept thinking about how creepy it had been seeing her grinning at me from behind the island like that. The sounds her hands made on the floor as she crawled away. I told myself she was just trying to be silly. Just trying to join me in my love of all things horror. It's not like I was afraid of her. But it still didn't sit right. I started seeing her peeking at me more and more. Sometimes she'd be peeking out from behind the couch or living room curtains. Once she even managed to get inside her grandmother's old trunk that sits at the foot of her bed. I might not have even known she was there if the trunk's old hinges had not given her away. She had the lid propped up just enough so that only half of her face peeked out. She'd been grinning like an excited toddler. It was unnerving. I didn't even know what to say to her. All I could do was stare. When I finally found my voice, I asked her why on earth was she doing this. She didn't answer, but she had slowly closed the lid, shutting herself inside the trunk. I just walked away, feeling disturbed. I didn't understand why she was doing it, but it clearly made her happy. I just hoped she would tire of the game quickly. Rebecca didn't peek at me for the next two weeks. I started to think she was done with her weird prank and I was relieved. We were watching a show on Netflix one night and I jokingly said that I hadn't seen her peeking at me lately and that she must have given up on her game. She looked up at me with a small smile and said, maybe I've just gotten better at it. I didn't say anything but I wondered whether or not she was joking. For the next few days I couldn't stop thinking about what she'd said. Was she still peeking at me while I wasn't looking and I just hadn't noticed? And if so, what the hell was she getting out of this? I started to feel paranoid, constantly checking whether she was watching from around the corner or behind a door. I was jumpy whenever I was home and she wasn't in full view of me. I felt stupid and a little crazy. But after a few weeks without another incident, I began to relax. I stopped checking behind furniture and walls and told myself it was just a bad memory. Then a few days ago things got so much worse. Rebecca left to go to a friend's and I lounged on the couch and played a couple games on my laptop. Around 9 p.m. I hopped in the shower and as I was washing the soap from my hair, I felt that awful feeling that I was being watched. I slowly opened my eyes and almost had a heart attack. Rebecca was peeking from behind the shower curtain, her entire head stretched into the shower, leaving just her body outside. Her long dark hair hung against the curtain, the ends dripping with water. Her mouth hung open in a terrible grin, eyes wide open and red, as if she hadn't blinked in a while. I screamed and jumped back against the wall. She didn't move, nor did her smile waver. Her makeup ran down her cheeks in two black streaks. She looked giddy and completely deranged. I was terrified. We stood like that for a few moments, neither of us saying a word. Finally, after what felt like forever, she slowly pulled her head back out of the shower and I watched her blurry figure through the curtain as she moved backwards towards the bathroom door. A second later the bathroom door slammed shut, hard enough to rattle the mirror. I screamed again and jumped out of the shower to lock the door. I stayed inside the bathroom for over an hour. Maybe I overreacted, but joke or not, I wasn't going to put up with the craziness anymore. That's what I kept telling myself as I paced in my bathroom, stopping to listen at the door every few minutes. Suddenly I heard a muffled sound, and I pressed my ear against the bathroom door, straining to listen. I couldn't hear anything, but I envisioned Rebecca standing on the other side of the door, giggling at her joke. I felt a surge of anger. I was beyond annoyed at being made to feel scared in my own house, and having to hide in the bathroom for an hour. 
All for what? If it was a joke, it was an awful one. What the hell, Rebecca? I snapped. This is getting really annoying. I waited for her to apologize or to call me a jerk. But instead, I heard a faint moan. So quiet, I wondered if I heard it at all. And then complete silence. Rebecca? I called out, not able to even hide the shakiness in my voice. I got no response. Just my own heavy breathing. I swear to God, just stop it. I yelled at her, pounding my fist on the door. I waited for her to cuss me out, something I would expect from me talking to her like that. I never screamed at her before. But there was nothing. Just the occasional drip from the shower head. I won't deny that I was scared. Too afraid to open the damn door and face my own wife. I waited another 30 minutes or so, which feels like a lifetime when you're scared. Finally, I decided I wasn't going to spend the night hiding in my bathroom, so I got down on my knees and peered under the door. I almost expected to see her face peeking back at me, but thankfully she was gone. I could see straight down the hallway to the top of the stairs, but no Rebecca. I didn't know if I should be happy about that or not. I looked for a few minutes, waiting to see her head pop up over the top step, but it never came. I stood up, my hand hovering over the door and prepared myself to open it. I slowly turned the lock with shaky fingers and was about to yank it open when I heard a sound that still makes me feel nauseous when I think about it. A moan. Louder than before. But this time I was able to tell just where it was coming from. I turned my head to the closet door as if in slow motion and locked eyes with my wife who was peeking out at me from the slight gap. Her eyes were still wide as ever and her mouth was hanging open in the most grotesque gaping smile. I didn't even scream. I was too scared for even that. Her hands were clasped to her chest, body trembling with sheer delight as if she could barely contain her excitement. A short raspy moan bubbled up from her throat deep and raw, sending a shiver through my entire body. Somehow I found the ability to pull the bathroom door open and ran as fast as I could all the way down the steps, snagging my keys and phone from the table in the living room before running outside to my car. I could hear her shrill laughter behind me, but I didn't hear her getting closer. I didn't bother shutting the front door. I drove away from the house faster than I legally should have, shivering the entire time either from fear or the cold. Maybe a little of both. I hadn't grabbed a coat or even a pair of shoes. I was still in my boxers and my hair was still damp. I drove straight to my brother Chris's house about 40 minutes away, ignoring any and every call and text I got. I didn't check my phone until I was safely parked in my brother's driveway. Rebecca had called four times and sent a flurry of texts, all wondering where I'd gone and why I left like that. I threw my phone at the dash. I was furious at her nonchalant attitude. My brother and his wife were surprised to see me show up. Especially dressed in just a pair of boxers, but told me to stay as long as I needed. Chris lent me some clothes and asked me what happened. I told him we had a fight, but didn't get into the details. I didn't want him to think I was overreacting, leaving my wife over a prank even if it was a strange one. I mean, hadn't I encouraged her for years to lighten up instead of being so serious all the time? I had wanted her to relax and loosen up, but this was definitely not what I had in mind. I tried to sleep on their sofa, but my brain wouldn't let me sleep. Every time I closed my eyes I saw Rebecca's face staring at me from inside the closet. Knowing she'd been in there with me the entire time made my skin crawl. She'd never left the bathroom at all. Instead, she slipped inside the closet and slammed the bathroom door shut to fool me. The mere thought of going back home gave me anxiety. I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. Chris ended up giving me a sleeping pill so I was able to get a little rest. My sleep was filled with terrible dreams. All of which were Rebecca's smiling face. I woke up just as the sun started to rise. My whole body ached and I felt drained. I knew I'd have to call her at some point, but I didn't know what to say to her. I wouldn't be going home unless she gave me her word she'd never do any more creepy stuff. 
I just wanted my wife back. Her normal serious self never looked so good to me. I was contemplating calling her and telling her when that familiar feeling came back. I was being watched. I was staring at the ceiling, my heart in my throat. I didn't want to look away but the longer I ignored the feeling the worse it got. My eyes drifted away from the ceiling almost on their own. Her face was pressed up against the window beside the couch, staring down at me with that same gaping smile. Drool dribbled down her lips, leaving two long streaks down the glass. I didn't know how long she'd been there, but something told me she'd been there quite a while, possibly all night. I didn't bother screaming, though I was afraid anger trumped any fear I felt at that moment. I jumped up from the couch and pounded my palm against the glass. Rebecca! Are you crazy? What the hell is wrong with you? Just go home. Now! She didn't move, and her ghastly expression never changed. If anything, her smile only grew, as if she had never been more elated. I could hear Chris and his wife moving around upstairs. As if Rebecca could hear them from her place outside, her head twitched slightly in their direction, and she began to close her mouth slowly. Chris called my name from upstairs, obviously concerned. I turned around to see him running down the stairs. When I turned back to the window, Rebecca had disappeared. The only sign she'd been there at all was the two streaks of drool still dripping down the glass. I tried explaining to Chris and Jess about waking up to see Rebecca watching me through their window. They were skeptical. We went outside to the spot in front of the window, but there were no footprints in the dirt, just a slight indent. Animal probably, Chris guessed, and I didn't argue. He and Jess assumed I dreamt the entire episode, but they didn't understand, and I was too tired to explain it to them. I called out of work that day and turned my phone off. I didn't want to face Rebecca. Just talking to her was too much for me at that point. I really started to believe something was irreversibly wrong with her. That no matter what promises she made we'd never be the same again. The thought saddened me to my core. I cried most of the morning. By noon I figured I was ready to confront her. Give her one last chance to explain herself. I could at least give her that after six years I told myself. I turned my phone on and saw the dozens of texts she'd sent, all from a seemingly concerned wife. Can we talk? I love you. Please call me. I'm really worried. Can you answer? Just come home. And more the same. All texts telling me she loved me, and she wanted me home. How worried she was. Not a damn one addressing the crazy crap she pulled. Like she hadn't been acting like a character from a Stephen King book. Even her texts were different. She normally texted novels just to tell me to pick up a loaf of bread. You'd think she'd have more to say to me after her bizarre shenanigans. I know it probably seems childish to some of you who are miles away from this situation. But if you saw the way Rebecca had looked at me, how she scampered away on all fours like some wild animal, grinning at me from inside the closet like a lunatic, then I think you'd find my reaction was warranted. I ended up staying with them for another night. I didn't wake up yesterday until afternoon, and thankfully I didn't see Rebecca's face watching me through the window. I don't want to pry, because it's not my place. But is this fight something that can be mended? Jess was asking me about the situation. She made us both a sandwich for lunch and I knew she wanted to breach the subject without seeming to be nosy. I don't know, she's like a different person. I chose my words carefully. I still wasn't ready for her or my brother to know the full extent of the craziness I had been dealing with. People change, but she's still the same woman you married. Maybe you both just need to talk through your issues. Whatever's going on, I'm sure it can be fixed. I think it's beyond that now. I don't think talking would help. I just don't trust her. The words stung in my heart. I missed and loved my wife. But how could I live with someone like that? Living in constant fear didn't sound too appealing. Rebecca loves you. She has to be absolutely crushed. I don't know about that. Well, she certainly seemed like it. 
I've never seen her so upset. It took a full minute for me to realize what she just said. And when I did, I felt dread rush over my body. Wait, what do you mean? You saw her? You saw Rebecca? I asked with my mouth suddenly feeling very dry. Jess nodded casually as if that fact was a nightmare fuel. Maybe for her it wasn't, but for me it was. She stopped by this morning just after Chris left for work. I didn't see her car though. Maybe she took an Uber or something. What did she say? Did, did she come inside? Sweat started to break out on my forehead. I began looking around, examining corners as though a predator lurked behind them. No, she just asked if you were awake yet and I said that you weren't. I asked if she wanted me to wake you but she said no. Just said to let you sleep. That's all, she didn't say anything else? No, she looked awful though. Like she hadn't slept in days. I think you should call her. I got from the table and thanked Jess for lunch. I felt a little bit better at the knowledge that at least she hadn't come inside. Still, I needed to double check that the doors were locked. I sat for a while trying to figure out what to do next. I didn't want to go home, but I felt that I owed it to Rebecca to help her if I could. Hadn't I swore an oath to love and honor her through sickness and in health? Clearly she was very sick. If she was sick, which I truly believed she was, I had to try and get her the help she needed. But I didn't even know where to start. I didn't want to call the police, and besides, what the hell was I going to tell them? That my wife was peeking at me? That she was being creepy? As bizarre as she'd been, she still hadn't committed any crime. Not yet anyway. The police would have probably said that I was overreacting. But this wasn't some prank. It felt wrong. Dangerous. Like something sinister lurked beneath her smile. I knew as her husband I was well within my rights to have her committed, but what if she simply acted normal in their presence? She'd obviously been able to fool Jess into thinking she was just a concerned wife. As long as the doctors didn't find her a danger to herself or others, they'd have no choice but to release her after 72 hours. I felt lost and overwhelmed. So I did what any husband in my position would do. I called her mother. I didn't want to, believe me. We were never on the best of terms. We never fought or anything like that. She just wasn't a very warm person and wasn't very easy to get along with. She hardly ever smiled and when she did, only her lips would move into a thin-lipped smile, leaving her eyes as blank as before. She gave off this aura that felt like she was permanently on the offensive. I'd only met her twice and both times were very short. I got the impression she didn't approve of me for her daughter. Rebecca always ushered us out quickly as she didn't want me to feel uncomfortable which I was grateful for. Being in her mother's company felt almost unbearable. Like walking on glass. I was glad when we moved three states away so we didn't have to see her often. I was happy to avoid the woman, but I needed her help. I really didn't want to talk to her, but I had to talk to someone. She was the only person who might know Rebecca better than me. I took a deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes, she answered, already sounding irritated. Marianne, it's me Ben. Do you have a minute to talk? I could hear her cluck her tongue in irritation. I'm in the middle of writing some checks. But if you insist, I suppose I can spare a moment. What is it that you want to discuss? It's about Rebecca. She's been acting strange. And I was wondering if you had any idea whether there was something she interrupted me abruptly. It's a bit difficult to follow your rambling Benjamin. What is that you want from me? I could almost see her standing there in her thin sweater and slacks, tapping her fingernails impatiently on the table. I wanted to know if you ever noticed any odd behavior or possibly any mental health issues. There was a long, uncomfortable pause, maybe because she was just thinking or something else. Finally, after a few seconds, she spoke. I'm not sure if this is one of your jokes, Benjamin, but if so, I don't find it very funny. 
Now I do have business to attend to, as I said, so if you don't mind, I cut her off before she could get rid of me. Marianne, it's not a joke. I'm sincerely concerned about Rebecca's mental health. Her behavior has been very erratic lately. I'm very worried about her, and I figured as her mother you would be as well. The frustration was evident in my voice. If you're truly concerned, then I suggest you get the health professionals involved. I don't know what you expect of me. She snapped. I could tell she was seconds away from hanging up, and for some reason I was desperate not to let her. I had the feeling that she knew a lot more than she was letting on. Please. If not for me, do it for Rebecca. I heard a faint shaky intake of breath, as if she were trying to hold her steely persona together, but failing. Marianne? Benjamin, I don't know what to tell you. My only advice would be to seek professional help. Do not call here again. I tried to call out to her, but she hung up. I tried to wrap my head around the call and her refusal to help me. Even if she didn't like me, why wouldn't she want to help her own daughter? I couldn't understand that. I tried to replay the conversation, desperate to find something I missed. I almost gave up, until I remembered her last words to me. Seek professional help, she'd said those words with a bit of urgency. I could have just been grasping at straws, but no, I was sure her voice had changed ever so slightly when she'd said that. As if those words were very important. What had she meant? I assumed she'd been referring to medical professionals, but maybe she was referring to someone else. Someone that for some reason, she didn't feel comfortable saying directly. Or maybe I was just desperate. I waited for Chris to get home and after a very long and exhausting conversation, I convinced them that Rebecca truly needed psychiatric help. I didn't tell them everything. I wasn't prepared to go into it yet, but I told them about our last encounter. How she hidden in the bathroom, peeking at me from the closet. They were obviously shocked, but thankfully they believed me. They too just wanted to help her. Still they didn't think it was all that serious. Weird, maybe but not dangerous. They just kept saying that Rebecca had to be playing some kind of weird joke. Maybe for YouTube? Jess offered, if only half-heartedly. Chris didn't think we should involve the police just yet. He offered instead to go with me, and I readily accepted. He reasoned that calmly talking to her, trying to coax her into going willingly was the best recourse. I agreed to do it his way. At least I wouldn't be going into that house alone. We drove over this morning, just after breakfast. There was no way I was going at night. When we pulled into the driveway my stomach began doing somersaults. Her car wasn't there, but I still didn't let my guard down. The front door was ajar, and for a split second I thought we'd see her eyes staring through the gap. I was shaking and starting to sweat. Chris, however, was fine. He waited for me to open the door, his hands in his pockets like he was going on a stroll through the park. I envied his ignorance. I pushed the door open and was immediately hit with the stench of rot. Chris smelled it too, and he walked in the house behind me with his nose scrunched up. My eyes were looking around for any signs of Rebecca. The house was deadly quiet and dark, despite being late in the morning. All the curtains were closed up tight, refusing to allow any sunlight inside. If I hadn't left just two days ago, I'd have thought the house to be abandoned. We moved through each room, carefully checking any place that she might hide, occasionally calling her name. Why the hell are you looking under the couch? Aren't we looking for your wife? He was looking at me like I was a moron. Let's just go upstairs. He shook his head but followed me up the stairs to check the bathroom and spare bedroom. On the way up, my shoes crunched over pieces of glass that looked to be littered over a few of the steps. I noticed that one of our wedding portraits that hung on the wall along the staircase had been smashed. The frame hung crookedly, all the glass was removed. I stared at the picture, a lump forming in my throat. We had taken the photo just after leaving the church. She looked so beautiful in her white gown. I looked at her beautiful face. 
I never dreamed her face would ever be a source of terror for me. We climbed the rest of the steps and checked the spare bedroom, but it looked completely untouched. I was hesitant to go into the bathroom, my fear from that night coming back to me all at once. Chris noticed and offered to go in by himself, but I couldn't let him do that. So we walked in together, checking the closet and the shower. The bathroom looked as if it hadn't been touched since the night I left. I don't think she's here. Why don't you pack some clothes and we'll try coming back tomorrow or something? I nodded and went into our bedroom and shoved some clothes into a duffel bag. When I checked inside our closet I found the source of the smell. I immediately started gagging. Chris took one look and lost all color in his face. He had to go stand by the stairs to get away from the sight and smell. I gazed down in shock at what lay inside my bedroom closet. Soaking into the rug were at least a dozen eyeballs, all carefully laid out in pairs. Some were as large as a coin, while others were as tiny as a marble. I stared down at the eyes she collected from small animals and I wondered how she'd gotten them. I shuddered at the thought. Man, I thought I had it bad with my wife's shoe addiction. Yours is in here collecting eyeballs. Chris said while gagging. Ben, I think we should go. He called from the hall. I'm getting nauseous. I grabbed my duffel and shut the closet door. I stepped out into the hall and took a deep breath of air. I could taste the rotten smell on my tongue and I couldn't help but gag. Who the hell lines up eyeballs in their closet like that? I tried to tell you she needed help. She doesn't need help, Ben. She needs an exorcist. You coming or what? I can't stand the smell anymore, his words died in his throat and his eyes grew wide with fear. I didn't ask him why. I could feel it. Someone was watching me and I didn't think it was the eyes in the closet. I turned around, my eyes slowly scanning the bedroom. Christ, I whispered as I finally saw what we'd missed. Under the bed, curled on her side, watching us with the excitement of a kid on Christmas morning, was my wife. She held her hands together just under her chin and they were shaking eagerly. Now that she knew she'd been found, I could hear the quiet noises she was making. A sort of hiccuping sound in her throat, as if the excitement was just too much for her. It was unnerving to say the least. Wide eyes, and that same huge smile. Everything in me told me to run, but I forced it away. This was my wife. No matter how twisted, she was still the woman I married. I had to help her. Rebecca, I said softly. She didn't respond, but her head bobbed back and forth in two quick little movements as if she were nodding. Baby, I just want to help, okay? Can you? Can you let me do that? I had taken a single step forward, approaching her like some kind of dangerous animal. I love you, Rebecca, I said softly, taking another step closer. She let a tiny moan escape her wide open mouth and I had to resist the urge to run. Her shoulders were starting to quiver and her eyes grew as large as saucers. I crouched down so I could see her better and immediately saw the blood. Her hands were covered in it. They trembled more the closer I got as if she was barely able to contain herself. Rebecca, are you hurt? You're bleeding. She bobbed her head again her bloody fingers moving up and down as if playing an invisible piano. They occasionally grazed her chin, leaving smears of blood on her skin. I wanted to recoil in disgust. The smell that was coming off of her was revolting. I could feel the vomit trying to climb up my throat. Her lips were dry and stretched thin, blood seeping between the cracks. I knew she wouldn't come on her own, but I didn't want to leave her in the state she was in. I scooted closer and reached out to her. The excited hiccuping sounds got louder and her hands shook, fingers flexing. It was then that I could see the blood oozing from in between her fingers. Oh my god, you're bleeding. Instinctively I reached out to take her hand, but before I could even touch her, her hand sprang out towards me. A sharp pain shot through my arm and I fell back on my ass. My arm burned and I could see the blood dripping down onto the carpet. 
I looked back at her in shock and saw her grinning madly, her fingers clutching a large shard of glass. You all right in there? Chris asked from behind me. I turned my head slightly and nodded to him, cradling my arm to my chest. When I turned back to face Rebecca, I saw that her focus had shifted. She wasn't looking at me anymore. And she wasn't smiling anymore either. She was staring past me, her eyes glaring at Chris the way a hungry lion might stare at an antelope. Her mouth was still hanging open but it was twisted into a snarl. I got to my feet and began walking backwards down the hall, afraid to take my eyes off her. Are you bleeding? The moment the words left his mouth Rebecca started fast scooting out from under the bed, the glass shard still in her fist. Chris, run, go! He must have been too afraid to move because a second later I felt my back bump into him. He was still standing at the top of the stairs, staring at the horror that was my wife. Rebecca had crawled completely out from under the bed and stood in the bedroom doorway, her face twisted in rage. Her whole body was visibly tense. Blood ran down her fingers and onto the floor. Jesus, Rebecca. My brother tried talking to her, but I reached back and pushed him towards the steps. Move your ass, I said as quietly but firmly as I could. Rebecca bobbed her head in sharp motions and began to grin, stretching her mouth open wider and wider so that her chin seemed to touch her chest. I heard Chris mutter a prayer and then he was running down the stairs. I stood at the top of the steps, stuck between self-preservation and the love for a woman who clearly needed serious help. I only want to help. I said whilst holding back tears. Her eyes focused on me once again as she slowly lifted the glass, holding it out in front of her. And then she started sprinting towards me, grinning with utter excitement. Thankfully my body took over and I flew down the stairs skipping two or three steps until the bottom. I made it to the front door before I felt her leap onto my back, wrapping her arms around my neck, her open mouth next to my ear so that I could hear those terrible hiccuping sounds. I shook her off me, knocking her to the floor. I felt a searing pain in my back as she fell but I tore open the front door and bolted to my car. Chris was standing in the front yard, talking on the phone with the police. I didn't say a word, I just ran to my car and jumped in. Chris took the hint and followed me, still on the line with the cops. I watched the rearview mirror, sure I'd see her there, running after us. But I never did. I went straight to the emergency room and got 11 stitches in my arm and 3 on my back. The police asked a lot of questions and went back to the house to do a search but of course, she wasn't there. They advised me to stay with a friend or relative for a while and to file a restraining order as soon as I could but none of those things would matter. I dropped Chris off at home and went to a motel an hour away. I wanted to put as much distance between me and Rebecca as I could. This is where I've been for the last four hours. I thought maybe the police would find her, maybe they'd get her the help she desperately needs. But now I don't think so. Because 40 minutes ago I got a text from an unknown number. Just three words. I found you. And a picture attached. The picture was dark and grainy, but I instantly knew what it was. There was no mistaking my wife's eye. I started typing this out immediately after. I don't know what to do. I'm alone and scared, and I can't help but feel that I'm being watched.